I'm Rebecca. This is Charles. We're going to teach you today at this crash course in supercomputing and it's going to be a fire hose. You're not going to learn everything that we teach you, but hopefully we'll get you somewhere along the way where you've learned some concepts at least. So we're going to start off first part of the course is on parallelism, teaching you about what is parallelism and MPI. And then the second part of our course is going to be on OpenMP and hybrid programming. So, um, yeah, that's that's basically how the course is going to go. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started on parallelism and MPI. So um, something to note is I like it when y'all interact with me, especially if you laugh at my jokes. I really appreciate that. <laughs> keeps me awake. Hopefully, it keeps you awake. I like to post random pictures of things that you may think like, why did she put that picture on there? Like, what's wrong with this lady? But um, so this is about parallelism and this is actually some blinds. Looks weird, like what? Blinds with little connection between them. But you'll see that that's actually very symbolic of how things go uh, when we're talking about parallel computing and stuff. Okay, so. First, we're going to cover some concepts of parallelization. We're going to talk about serial versus parallel, and then we're going to give you some parallelization strategies. So, generally speaking, why we want to do parallelism, right? It lets us work smarter, not harder, by simultaneously tackling multiple tasks. Um, so, how do we how do we parallelize? Um, basically, we just divide a task or a problem into smaller subtasks that can be executed all at the same time. And the benefit of this is that we can get our work done more efficiently and more quickly. So parallelization, this applies also in your daily life. Like you may not think of it that way, um, but really everything that you do in life is an algorithm. <laughs> you may not realize that. But let's pretend like we're going to prepare dinner, okay? Now, I'm talking about food. I apologize to y'all, but it is just after lunchtime here in, a, in, in the Bay Area, so hopefully people aren't too hungry. Um, I grew up, as I told you, I grew up in Kentucky uh, in the South. I learned that the way to a man's heart is through his stomach, but I also believe the way to a student's brain is also through their stomach, so that's why we're taking this route. So let's pretend that we're going to prepare a lasagna dinner, okay? So who, does everybody kind of understand approximately how to make a lasagna? Like you may not actually have ever made one. You may not know a recipe for it, but you have an idea, right? It's layers of different stuff, like there's sauce, there's cheese, there's lasagna noodles, et cetera, right? And you, you have to put them all together and you bake it in the oven. Okay. So... So um, there are different types of tasks here. So some of our tasks we have to do uh, in a specific order, right? And then some of our tasks we can do independently of one another, like the order doesn't matter. So if I'm gonna make my lasagna, right? I can, um, I can grate the cheese first and then make my sauce or I can make my sauce and then grate the cheese, right? Those are independent actions, right? Like it doesn't matter which one happens first or when, as long as they both get done, and then I go on to my next step of, of um, making my lasagna. So this is the difference between tasks that are serial, where they have to be performed in a sequence versus tasks that are parallel. Like, like I was saying, like the cheese and the sauce, like I can make those at the same time. I can make one first, I can make the other one first. It doesn't matter. However, there is a parallel task involved in this. Like I have to have all of those things made and then I have to assemble my lasagna and then I have to bake it in the oven, right? I can't do that in a different order. I can't bake it first and then assemble it, right? Because then it wouldn't be a lasagna. So. Those tasks, those larger tasks, are serial, but uh, the, the smaller tasks, we can do them in parallel. So here's some pictures of, of the idea. Okay, so if we have tasks that we have to do in a sequence, 
then that is serial computing. We have tasks that we can do in different orders that are independent of one another. That's parallel computing. And so computing and cooking are very similar in that regard, right? Like, like we, can do, we can do either one. So with our lasagna, so here are our serial tasks. So uh, we have to make, all, make the sauce and all that stuff, right? We have to assemble the lasagna and bake the lasagna. Uh, we have to wash up, like if we're gonna make a salad with our lasagna, let's say, uh, we have to wash up our lettuce and we have to cut it up and stuff. And then we have to assemble the salad. Um, but the larger parallelism of this is uh, I can make a lasagna, I can make a salad. Those are independent tasks, right? They don't need to be done together. I can set the table at any time also, right? Um, and so, so that's, that's what I'm trying to explain is that like there's some tasks that you have to do them in a particular order and there's other tasks that are independent of one another and you can do them in any order. And, and the ones that are independent, you can do in any order. That is what is a parallel task. So, so here's, here's exactly how we're going to, like, if we're going to make our lasagna dinner that has a lasagna, um, a salad, and some garlic bread, okay? Those are three parallel tasks that we could perform in parallel. Um, and, but then there are some tasks that we have to complete in order within each of those tasks, right? So we have to make our sauce, we have to cook our noodles, we have to grate the cheese before we can assemble our lasagna, right? And then um, we also have to assemble it before we can bake it. And we have to bake it before we can serve it for dinner. Likewise, with our salad, you know, we have to wash our lettuce and vegetables and we have to cut them up before we can assemble our salad, right? We can't assemble the salad first and then cut it up. Like that would be weird, that wouldn't work. Um, and similarly, with our garlic bread, let's assume we have a loaf of bread that we're just going to cut up and put garlic butter in it. Well, we got to prep our butter and we got to cut our bread before we can spread the, the, the butter on the bread, right? I know these are, this all sounds like a little ridiculous, like, of course, Rebecca, of course, yes, this makes sense. But, but I just want, I'm just trying to drive this home. So then there are some things, though, in this, in this case, where we have to do some things that are kind of like gating um, our ability to continue in the task, right? So we call these synchronization points. So we have to complete making our sauce, complete cooking our noodles, and complete grating our cheese before we can assemble the lasagna, right? Like those are three prerequisite, prerequisites for going on to the next step. Okay. Uh, so does anybody else, anybody here like to make like really big meals like, you know, Thanksgiving dinner or, you know, Christmas dinner or something like that? Anybody besides me? I don't like to, but I get the sign with them. Oh, you meat. get to. <laughs> okay. I'm a good cook. Well, see, I like, I like doing it because I like to plan it all out. So, um, see this little graph I made here? Because like, total nerd. Do y'all do that? Like, if you're making a big meal, you're like, okay, well, we're going to have Thanksgiving at 6 p.m., right? So then I, you know, yes, okay. So it's going to take so many hours for the turkey to cook. So that means that it has to be in the oven by two or something. And then, right? Do that yeah. yeah yeah so you plan it all out i've been doing it for 12 years so i got it kind of on autopilot each holiday yeah yeah <laughs> but the first time you did it you probably planned it all out you probably wrote down like okay two o'clock turkey in oven three o'clock start making the mashed potatoes or whatever right yeah yeah so you can see how we were able to pack all of these in to the time like if we had to do everything in cereal right if, if all of our tasks had to be done in cereal, and the colors are kind of color coded for what we're doing, right? So the kind of purpley ready parts, those are, um, those are the lasagna, and that big long one in the background there, that's the lasagna baking. Um, while it's baking, then we don't have any more lasagna tasks to do, so we can do salad tasks, those are the green ones. Uh, and then we have, we can rest for a few minutes because now we got to do our garlic bread, right? Because we want it to be hot when it comes out of the oven too. Um, so that's kind of the yellow orangey stuff in there. That's the garlic bread. 
Um, and then while both the garlic bread and the lasagna are in the oven finishing up, then we can set the table. That's the blue. So if we couldn't pack all of those things in in parallel, it would have taken us like all day to make dinner. But instead, since we can do it all in parallel like that, we can just compress it. So really, we just have to start at 415. Okay, so another way that we could parallelize this is we could have several chefs. So I have a sous chef at home. He's 16. He, he's pretty good at making certain things. If you ever need pancakes or anything, he's your man. But anyway, we could have several chefs and we could have each one of them perform a parallel task. That'd be another way that we could parallelize our work, right? And that is really the concept behind parallel computing is instead of having one processor that's doing all of the work, you have a bunch of different ones and they're all working together towards the same goal. Okay, so I'm gonna pause here and see if there's any questions. Anybody have any questions for me? Not yet, Alrighty. Okay, so let's talk about jigsaw puzzles. Anybody here like to do puzzles? Yeah? Okay, we got a few, not everybody. Okay, let's say we want to do like one of those really giant ones, like 10,000 piece puzzles. Anybody done a big puzzle like that? What's, yeah, I don't know if I've done one quite that big, but anyway, let's pretend for the sake of argument that everyone can complete a puzzle in T hours. Let's say that everyone does puzzles at the same rate, okay? I know this is an imperfect analogy, but we're just gonna go with it. So how can we decrease the wall time to completion of our puzzle? So what I literally mean by wall time is that clock that's on the wall there and how much time elapses on that. So if it takes T hours to complete our 10,000 piece jigsaw puzzle. So how can we reduce that from a T hours? Add people. Yeah, right. So let's say that we, you know, I'm at a table and I'm like, hey, my son, come help me, right? He's, I'm, I'm victimizing him and he's not even here. Um, <laughs> let's pretend that, I, that I'm just like, hey, come here and help me, right? So now the two of us are sitting at the table. So how long is it going to take us, assuming again, we both complete puzzles and it, you know, it would take by ourselves, it would take T hours to complete the puzzle. Uh, how long would it take the two of us to complete the puzzle? <clears throat> Say it louder. T over two. Okay. Any other ideas? Yeah. You still say T. Oh, that's kind of depressing. Slightly less. Okay. All right. How about you? <laughs> ah, have you met my son? No. no. Yes, that is right. So it's going to take us about T over two time, hopefully, but there's going to be some overhead involved in us working together to complete the puzzle. Have you ever worked with somebody and they're like going like this and, and like the, the one piece that you want is like right under their elbow? Yeah, I've done that. Okay. So, and then also, yes, if you're arguing about it, you know, uh, it, it's going to take it's going to take a little bit. So there's going to be some communication involved, right? Because I'm going to have to say, "Move your elbow, please," so that I can get that piece. Or I might say, "Can you pass me that piece?" So there's going to be some latency there where he has to stop what he's doing and give me the piece, right? Uh, there's going to be resource contention, possibly, right? Because maybe I have a piece that he wants, or he has a piece that I want, or vice versa. Right, so there's going to be a little bit of overhead, but overall it's going to be pretty close to T over two hours for us to complete our puzzle together. Okay, now let's see. So, um, so we tried. So the, the P equals one case. We know that's T hours. The P equals two case. That's about, you know, P over or T over two, give or take, plus a little bit more. Uh, four people. If we had four people at the table, that'd probably work, right? But what if we what if we have five thousand people at the table? No, no, no. You gonna see somebody shaking their head violently? No. Okay, why not? What's wrong with five thousand people at the table? Yeah. 
They won't fit at the table. That's a big problem. Yes. Not enough resources, right? Yeah, right. Or if we had a table that was big enough to fit them, then how would you reach the puzzle? The puzzle would be like, you know, tidy compared to this 5,000 person uh, table, which I don't think I've ever seen one. But yes, okay, so 5,000 people, that wouldn't work, right? So there may be kind of an upper limit on the number of people that you can use that would actually be useful. Another thing is if you have 5,000 people and you have 10,000 pieces, then each person adds two pieces to the puzzle. You know, it seems like an awful lot. I mean, like, can you imagine assembling 5,000 people and you're like, okay, we're gonna do this puzzle. I mean, it would take longer to assemble all those people probably than it would to just do the puzzle yourself, probably. Okay. All right, so um, I'm a math scientist, so I have other ideas about how to do a jigsaw puzzle. Okay, so now we're gonna do the COVID socially distance appropriate uh, way of doing our puzzle, okay? So we have P people, each at a separate table with N over P pieces each, okay? We're gonna assume for the sake of argument that you, you have pieces that are like all together in the puzzle. You don't have like one piece from one corner and one piece from another corner or something. Like you have some kind of, some, some kind of, you know, part of the puzzle. Okay, so in this COVID socially distanced um, proposed uh, method of, of doing puzzles, um, let's say, let's, let's set P equals two again, right? So one person's over here at their table, another person's over there at their table, and they're doing their own parts of the puzzle. Okay, so what's gonna be sort of the wall time to completion of that puzzle? Anybody have any feeling about that? T over two, there's not much communicating to do just at the end. Okay, that's true. So there's there's T over two in some sense because there's not much communication except for at the very end. Yeah. Is it assumed that each separate table has the exact pieces they need to solve their puzzle? Yeah, let's say that's true, pretty much. That's pretty much true. However, there are some pieces, you know, that are going to be on the border, right? Like that are going to be part of, maybe I have those pieces, but they're the next pieces in your part of the puzzle, right? You know what I mean? So, so there's going to need to be some communication at the end, right? And what is the cost of that communication? Because we're socially distanced, we're all the way across the room from each other. Yeah, it's going to be a lot more expensive, right, than if we were at the same table. Yeah. You're going to have to like shout across and then I'm going to say, what? What did you say? Yeah. Right. And then if you actually did have a piece that I wanted or if we're, you know, or when we're assembling the final puzzle together, you know, you have to get up out of your chair have to walk all the way over to where I am and bring your pieces with you, right? So that's going to be a very expensive communication versus when we are all at the same table, it's fairly cheap, right? Like I can just, if I have something under my elbow, I can just pass it straight to you. Okay, so at the end, you're just going to have to have like some kind of a giant spatula, right? And just like pick up all of your puzzle that you've completed and bring it over to the other table and Put them together, join them up. Okay. All right, I've got another setup because, like I said, I am a mad scientist, so I have other plans. So you didn't like that plan. What if instead we just divide it up based on the the features of the puzzle? We just divide it up to give each person gets part of the puzzle. Uh, based on the features of it. So, you know, we've got this beautiful landscape puzzle. It's got a mountain, sky, streams, tree, a meadow, you know, all these things, right? So I just, I'll take the mountain, you take the sky, you take the stream, you take the tree, you take the meadow. How does that sound? Does that sound like a good way to divide up the work? Ooh, ooh, good question. Can helpers go help someone after they've finished their part? Well, why would you need to do something like that? Not all parts are oh, not all parts are created equal. True, good point. That's part of uh, the beauty of, of, of art, right? Is that, you know, there's different proportions of these different things. If you had, yes, if you had equal 
parts mountain, sky, stream, it would be kind of a boring puzzle. It wouldn't be very pretty. So you're right. So there could be a load imbalance in this division of labor, right? Good point, yes. And so then we could do something that they sometimes call work stealing, right? Where you could, you could take some of the load of this giant mountain that I'm doing off of me um, if you were finished with doing the sky, whatever. Um, are there any other potential issues here that you can think of? Dividing the mountain, the sky, and the stream. Yeah, uh, that's right. And then another thing is like, some pieces, if you've ever done a puzzle, they're like part mountain and part sky. And like, how do you decide who does that piece go to? Does it go to the sky person or the mountain person, right? Um, and so that's a further complication of exactly how you would balance that load and exactly which pile you would put it in. That's right. Let's see what else. Just making sure on here. Okay. Glad everybody's kind of tuning in here. This is great. Okay. So next we're going to talk about parallel algorithm design. So there's an acronym that you can remember called PKM. Um, and this is how I this is how I work all the time if I'm going to make a parallel algorithm. So so the first thing, the P stands for partition. So what we want to do is we want to decompose the problem into the finest grained tasks to maximize the potential for parallelism. So at this point, we're not thinking practically, we're just gonna divide it up into tiny little pieces, our algorithm into tiny little pieces and, and see if any of those pieces have a potential for parallelism. Okay, so then the next thing that we do is the C's that said for communication. So we're gonna determine the communication pattern amongst our tasks. Um, so, that, that, that has to do with like which tasks are dependent on one another and which tasks require the input of another task. So back to our, uh, you know, our lasagna example. So if, um, if I'm making the sauce, okay, it, it has, it needs tomatoes, it needs, um, you know, herbs and spices and it needs water. I don't know. I made all that up because I don't actually know how to make lasagna off the top of my head either. Okay, so, um, you know, we could add all of those. Those are those are all tasks, right? Like add the tomatoes, add the water, add the spices. Uh, but are they dependent on one another? You have to do one before you can do the other. You know, who knows? So you would have to figure that out. Um, okay, the next task is agglomeration. So again, par partition and communication. You're just being non-judgmental about it and you're just trying to break it up as best you can and then see where the connections are. At the point of agglomeration, you're starting to think practically about it. So you're starting to think about combining it into coarser grain tasks if necessary in order to reduce any communication requirements or other costs. So you might decide that, okay, I really can't break down the uh, making of the sauce into a task. So I'm just gonna assign one chef to make sauce instead of having a bunch of chefs and one of them is the like the, the water chef who just goes around pouring water right like that might just not be very efficient for you um and then the last thing is mapping and at this point you're assigning uh these tasks that you've agglomerated to processors um subject to a, the trade-off between communication cost and concurrency so it's really great if we can do things in parallel, right? Like if we have 5,000 people doing our 10,000 uh, 10, piece puzzle, right? They can really quickly complete their parts, right? I mean, they're done before you even know what happened. But there's all this overhead of communication costs, right? Like because you have to coordinate between 5,000 people to get them all, to put all of their pieces together, right? So you have to think about that, to think about that trade-off between concurrency, where you have the maximal parallelism, but also this expensive communication cost when you have to bring everything back together. It's almost like you don't want to have too many chefs in the kitchen. You know, maybe if you have four dishes, you might want to have four to six, but not 10, because everyone's fighting over utensils and contending for resources. 
So you want to have a good balance of what is being split up and then what it can be done serially. All right, so anybody have any questions before we go on? Because that's before we go on. Yeah. What are some factors that we should consider when we're trying to determine the type of communication patterns and the resources that we need to use? How would, at a high level, how would we try to identify those components? Good question. Are you at, you're actually asking me or are you asking? I'm asking everyone. Everyone. Okay. So what kind of factors do we need to consider when we're thinking about parallelism and we're thinking about the communication costs and how to parallelize things? Any ideas? Categorization. What was that? Um, categorization. Categorization. Could you elaborate a little bit more? Stuff that's related to each other in a certain section, and then parts that are not related but out or out in the go to like a different kind of like section. So that whenever it comes to a certain point, it's even then you have a like a synchronization point to where you want to go. Okay, and what was your name again? Uh, Phoenix. Phoenix said categorization, which I think you were alluding to what we call data dependency and locality meaning that you want um, data that is going to be used by processes that are uh, closer together to be either in that same shared memory of that node so that the communication is less. So a lot of it has to depend on making sure that the computation that is being done for appropriate um, contingent processes is being done in a manner that will allow for the most efficient communication. So if you have you know, 10,000 processors on 100 nodes, and um, you have one community, you have four communications, and three other communications are on node 50, and the other communication is on node 100. You want to try to move it to a closer proximity because we're limited by things like bandwidth and the interconnect of our networks, too. Yeah, and actually, that's good lead into what somebody else says because. Um, Bandwidth and latency of communication is an important thing to think about. And so how much you can say how fast with how much delay. That's a really good way of putting it. Thank you, James. Um, right, so um, it, it may depend on the architecture of the system that you're using. If you have a system that is really great with bandwidth and communications can go really fast, then you might be able to break things up better, you know, and, and have a more efficient um, you know, a more efficient algorithm on that machine versus if you have a machine where it's just like sipping through like one of those tiny straws and, and you're just not getting a whole lot of data being able to be pushed through there, then you may need to do something, uh, something different with your algorithm in order to accommodate for that type of a machine. Yes. That's an excellent question. So the question was about, do we care about fault tolerance with what we're talking about here? Um, because like, yeah, if, if, if a link fails or something, um, you know, then, then you might need to recover from that. If you have a node that goes down or if you have a, a link, you know, like a, a, you know, a path basically from one node to another that fails, then what do we need to do about that? So um, we're not gonna worry about fault tolerance today, but that is definitely something that people, people are concerned about. Um, that, um, so in fact, when I, when I worked at Oak Ridge, had a postdoc there and he was working on fault tolerance and, and trying to add that into the MPI standard. Um, and it, it didn't make it in at that time, um, but it's a really interesting concept um, because, yeah, with these big machines, if you figure you have, you know, I don't know, 5,000 nodes on the machine, um, if you had 5,000 laptops 
any of them could fail at some time, right? Like one laptop, it only fails every so often, but um, 5,000 laptops, and one of them failing is gonna be a much more frequent occurrence, right? So that's something that is definitely a concern that, that you need to consider. Um, but most of the time, because you know they make these machines quite reliable, they, they're not gonna sell you a machine that goes down every five minutes. So um, most of the time you can get away with not really worrying about it too much. Yes. Load balancing. Yes, we definitely care about load balancing because um, you know basically when you when you get a when you run your code on a supercomputer, you get a job and you have like a certain amount of time, up to that amount of time for your job to run. And so if it's really imbalanced, then it's gonna it's gonna skew it. You're gonna have one node that's really, really busy. You're going to have all the rest of them that are just, you know, idle and sitting around and wasting time, but you're still paying effectively for all of those nodes when you're running that job. So you don't want that if you can avoid it. Ever. It's like what? Every group project ever. Every group project <laughs> ever, yes. Yes. Right. Okay, let's see if we've got any more questions. Yeah, okay. Can we repeat the? Yes, sorry, Sonia. I was definitely trying to do that. Thank you. Okay. All right, well, let's move on to the next topic. So we're gonna talk about supercomputer architecture. We're gonna talk about what is a supercomputer and we're just gonna have kind of a conceptual overview of architecture. We're not gonna get deep down into it. Um, so here's like some pictures of some of my favorite supercomputers. So the Cray one is still my favorite. It's from 1976. Um, but it, you see it kind of has this round shape to it. And um, the part that's in the, that's, that goes up high in the middle, that's the computer. The part that goes around it, uh, that's, that has leather on it, I think, or maybe it's fake leather. It was the 70s, who knows? Uh, in any case, that part is the cooling system. Um, and so the, they advertise this thing as something that you could buy this for your company, right? And you could set it out like in the lobby because it's pretty classy looking, really. And you could have people sit there while they wait for an appointment with your CEO. So that's pretty cool. If anybody ever sees one for sale on eBay or something, let me know because I'm going to put it in my living room. <laughs> okay. Uh, although your phone is like a thousand times more powerful than that thing. But anyway. Um, so then the, the other ones here, the uh, blue jean, that was a pretty innovative machine. And it looks like my picture is kind of messed up there, but in reality, they really did have this like trapezoid shape or par parallelogram shape. Uh, and that had to do with the cooling system. Like that's how the, they made the air go through it. Um, and then the Cray XT5 Jaguar there, that was my first supercomputer. And yes, I owned it. No, I didn't own it. But it was at Oak Ridge. Um, it was the first uh, petaflop computer that was actually kind of a useful machine. Um, and it was a great machine, and I missed it. And then um, this final picture on the right, that is the architecture of our machine that we have today downstairs called Perlmutter. And so you can see that these machines consist of a bunch of little parts all put together to create one giant machine. So we have, um, well, the cooling, that's kind of interesting, but we've got the compute blades. We've got multiple compute blades, and they in each chassis has multiple compute blades in it, and then multiple chassis in each of uh, each of the cabinets, and then we have many cabinets down there of the machine. So that's kind of how it works. Okay, so what is a supercomputer? Well, according to Henry Neiman, he's my academic brother. We have the same advisor, so he must know what he's talking about. Um, a supercomputer is the biggest, fastest computer right this minute. And that's basically the concept behind it. Generally, it's a machine that's going to be at least 100 times more powerful than your PC of the era. Um, so you might also hear people talk about supercomputing, high performance computing, scientific computing. Those are all different sides of the same coin, although that's more than two sides. So maybe it's not a coin at that point. But you get my point. And the idea here that we do here at NERSC and uh, 
at a lot of academic institutions is that scientists are using our supercomputers to solve really complex problems. These are really hard problems. They need large supercomputers and they can't be solved in any other way. So we're gonna talk about different types of architectures of machines now. So SMP stands for a symmetric multiprocessing architecture. This is one of the two big types of architectures. So these are commonly used in supercomputers, servers, and high performance computing environments. Um, basically, the idea is that you have one memory and all of your processors have equal access to that memory and input output devices. Um, so you have a gigantic memory and it's shared between multiple processors and any processor can work on any task, no matter where it's located in memory. This is really great if you're doing sums or loops or things like that. Really great way to parallelize those. So SMP systems and architectures, um, they're really good about uh, allowing really good load balancing and resource utilization across multiple processors. Okay. Um, so that's the SMP architecture. The next thing is a cluster architecture. This is kind of you have a bunch of CPUs, they're in racks, and they do computations individually, and they're very fast. They, they have their own personal memory that is not shared outside of that particular CPU. Um, and they communicate through network connections, and the communication through the network is very slow compared to how fast you can do a computation. So if you're on a cluster architecture machine, you want to write programs that are going to divide your computations evenly, but that minimize the amount of communication that you do. Okay, so you all remember when we were talking about the puzzle and you all were like, this lady is insane. Why are we talking about this? Well, if you could think of a table as being a memory, the puzzle is like the work that you have to do and the people are the processors, then um, our first proposal where we had people around a table all working on the same puzzle, that is like on an SMP architecture. Yeah, you see how that works? Yeah, hmm? not quite, but pretty close, yeah. Okay, and then my other socially distanced proposal, that is like a cluster architecture, right? Where we're distributed, we're really efficient at doing the parts of the puzzle that we, that we own, but then when it comes to communication, it's really expensive. We have our own memories. We don't ever interact except for when we share through communication. Okay. Diagram that stuff. Voila, diagram. Okay. So, um, yeah, so the big difference is that, um, that in, a, uh, in an SMP architecture, you know, they all share the memory together. In a cluster architecture, they have their own memory within, uh, within the node. Now, today we have machines that basically combine most of these things through having a hybrid architecture. So you might have nodes that have 16, that would be small nowadays, um, up to 128 core nodes, and they're connected to other nodes with a slow interconnect. So like within the node, they share memory. So it's kind of like a small SMP in, an, in a node. Um, but if you look like from a larger scale, from the you know, 10,000 foot version of it, it's like a cluster. Well, it is a cluster because it has all of these different nodes and they are separate and they don't share memory between nodes, but within a node, they do share memory. So, um, in order to take advantage of all of the parallelism possible, we would want to use MPI. I'm going to tell you about what that is in a minute. Uh, in order to to do this distributed memory parallelism, and OpenMP in order to do this shared memory parallelism in our program. Okay. Now, also there are machines that have a a CPU and a GPU or some kind of an accelerator on them. This has become very common. Um, essentially what you do with those types of machines is the GPU is like really good at doing math and that's it. Like doing floating point operations, it's, it's really good at that and it can't really do much else. 
but it's very fast at that. So you would offload any computationally intensive stuff to the GPU, and you would keep the CPU for doing more of the other stuff like, um, you know, conditional statements, logic, and communicating with other nodes and stuff. Um, it's pretty complicated uh, to program for these, and we're not going to talk about it today. It's outside of the scope of what we're learning today, but um, just know that that exists and that you know, that would be the next step once you understand how it works on a regular CPU only machine, uh, then you could move on to this type of machine. Okay, so before we get started with this, I'm going to see what questions we might have in the chat. Yep, the seats were cooling. Yep, that's right, Alfred. Okay. Um, Our motor has both CPU and GPU, right? Promoter does have both CPU nodes and CPU GPU nodes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. So I know uh, the networking like the slingshot interconnects were considered a big deal. Are they still drastically slower than in memory access times? Communication times? Uh yeah. Okay. So the question is, is the is the um, so we have the slingshot network, and is it still drastically slower than in memory accessing? And yes. Yes, it is. I mean, because first of all, you have to send a message that says, I want this thing, right? Or you have to receive a message from somewhere else that, you know, knew it was coming. But still, you're retrieving from one memory, sending it to another, and then retrieving it there. So it's just necessary, by necessity, it's just going to be slower by a lot. Yeah. Do, do supercomputers have like a faster speed, or is it just that they're more processors? Do supercomputers have a faster clock speed, or is it just that there are more processors? It's really just that there are more processors. Yeah. Um, so they consist on the say of the same chips that are out now. It's just the way that we configure things together to do, to get more computational power. But we don't have a magic quantum processor yet that we can do. Well, we're getting there, but right. So. That's right. So it just it really just mainly uses commodity parts. Um, the thing that also I would say differentiates a supercomputer like we have from a cluster that anyone can build is really the interconnect. So we have an extremely fast interconnect. I mean, it's still slow compared to uh, memory retrievals, but um, it's it's much faster than and than you could just buy off the shelf from. I don't know. Not Best Buy, but like Newegg or whatever. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Ethernet, I guess maybe. So what? Um, so it's a lot of contention for memory and applications. What? Um, who could kind of enlighten us on what would be the most efficient form of memory that we would want to use to minimize uh, communication off chip to uh, off chip memory? What are some of the how what do you think would be the best type of memory to use that's available on the entire system? Are are you alluding to like near memory computation mm -hmm. or something else? Exactly. Okay. Like like on chip memory like on mm -hmm. SOC. Yep. So you want to keep in mind that you on chip you do a diagram. Is this uh, yeah. erasable? Uh, yeah, I used that. Okay. You use it. Yeah. And so are you sure? Yeah. So, I mean, if you want to consider, let's say we have a, let's say this is a node. And on this node, we have different processors. And each processor has multiple cores. Um, the easiest way to minimize any data communication would be to use memory that is in the registers of our chips. So, you know, registers are just basically right there. They're a little bit smaller in cache, um, but they can do for quick um, computations that you need to use and for, you know, repeated calculations. You want to have those in the register. And how do you control what goes into the register? Like what, what language would we use to control what goes into the register? 
Assembly. Assembly, right. So that is the quickest way. The next is using the cache. And with cache, you can have a L1 cache, a L2 cache, and sometimes they'll have a shared L3. So typically, um, a lot of times, each core will have its own L1 and L2, and then each chip will have like a shared L3. And then from there, you might have either, um, you have, might have on-chip memory that is larger than the L3, or you might have off-chip memory as well that is shared amongst all of the chips in the system. And then if you have to go out of the node to a shared bus, then that's like really slow. So it's kind of different considerations, and that's when we get into understanding like data partitioning and cache blocking to minimize the size of different um, data for different computations. So a lot of different factors that we have to consider in trying to optimize applications. We had a question? There's one other difference between the L3 So typically, and a lot, sometimes some chips might not have an L3 cache. Most all will have an L1 and L2. Sometimes they'll have a L3 that is on the chip that can be used, and it's a lot. It could probably be like um, twice as big as the L2 cache. Um, and then you could also have, do not have an L3 on each chip. It'll be a shared L3 for all of the chips. Or also a larger shared memory that is still on, either on within the node shared, or it could be out of the node. If there's a shared L3 between all the chips, like what type of, would that be something on the motherboard? Would you install an L3 cache module? How does that work? Yeah, it would be like, mm, we can get into the weeds about, because there are different ways in which you could configure it. Um, and that's why we, they, we migrated to different levels of cache when, you know, in the 90s, it just used to be like a L1 and L2 that would be used and everything else was forced into memory. And then we started making better use of registers and whatnot. So that's kind of you know one area that we research and experiment, trying to figure out new ways to store or new kind of architectures that we can use for more efficient processing. And that's kind of like how we went from you know focusing on CPUs to GPU computation with the advent of graphics, and then realizing it could be used for quick calculations as well. So. A lot of things to consider, you know, just because we do it this way doesn't mean that they're, that's the best way. And so, you know, that's one thing about scientific computing. You can be creative and come up with new solutions. Yeah, so we got one question online that I wanted to answer. So what is the advantage of having multiple nodes in the cluster architecture? How do you decide how many cores should go into one node before there is no more gain? Uh, Tanvir, that is an excellent question. I don't know that anybody has an answer to it, to be honest with you. Um, so, the, uh, so I can tell you that why we would have multiple nodes um, rather than trying to have one gigantic, as they call it, a fat node. Um, the reason is because it's cheaper. <laughs> you know, if you can buy commodity parts and put them all in the you know on a commodity motherboard and stuff that's a lot cheaper than if you have to go you have to design something that has this you know gigantic memory and and that um, can have all these multiple cores um, now how do you decide how many cores should go into one node before there's no more gain i i don't think that we really think of it that way i think just what we think of is like what is available um, and so um, in order to increase the performance of a node, uh, it used to be pretty easy. You could just kind of move things a lot closer to each other. Okay, um, back in, back when I was your age, um, we just really had nodes that had a single core, you know, and what they would do is they would increasingly miniaturize that core. And, and then and then there would just be better performance just because you know the speed of light is finite right so then uh, you know if you get twice as close then then you can go at twice the speed. Um, but then uh, eventually we get to the point where that that doesn't work anymore um, you know we're down to where it's like. 
don't know, what is it, like six nanometers or something. Mm -hmm. I mean, really small distances in a, in a single core. And, you know, now there's just a couple of atoms right there. You know, you can't get any smaller, really. Um, and so what they, what they did instead with that was they started putting multiple cores on a node, or on a chip, I should say, multiple cores in the same CPU. This is starting to become confusing because a CPU used to just have one core. Now a CPU has multiple cores and the number of cores in a CPU has been growing a lot. I remember we got our first quad core machine when I was at Oak Ridge. I mean, and that was like huge. We went from having, I guess we had maybe two cores and then we had four cores. And I mean, that wasn't, yes, it was long ago to some of you, but it really wasn't that long ago. I mean, it was like 2008. Okay, so that's really not that long ago. I think everyone in this room was alive in 2008, right? So it's within your lifetimes, at least, and relatively short within your lifetimes. Like, I don't think any of you were babies in 2008, at least I hope not. Uh, but anyway, so they've just, that's the way that they've been able to get more performance out of a CPU is just by adding more and more and more um, cores into the CPU. So I hope that sort of helps answer your question. Oh, okay, you were legally dead for tax purposes. That's reasonable. Okay, is there some performance bottleneck when multiple nodes are working together, when some nodes have very high performance devices, but others have very low performance devices? That is a great question, and in fact, there definitely is. And in fact, you can think of this in some sense when we're, when we're talking about this um, CPU plus GPU model. Um, so CPUs, you know, I mean, they're pretty fast, but they don't compare to a GPU. So you could think of that a CPU as having very low performance in terms of being able to do flops. And then a GPU has having very high performance. And so there is some kind of trade-off, like what part of the work are you gonna send to the CPU or to the GPU versus what are you gonna keep for the CPU in that? Um, and yes, you could also have a heterogeneous cluster uh, I know some universities, for example, take everybody's old desktop machines and they make them into a cluster and then they period periodically get rid of the oldest ones and then put in a refresh of machines that are only five years old instead of 10 years old or whatever. Um, but, um, and so that can be quite challenging. So you just kind of have to figure out like, how to, um, yeah, how to balance the work that you do and distribute it evenly across them. I mean, maybe not the same number of tasks, but maybe the same amount of work that's going to take the same amount of time for each of them to complete. Okay. Alrighty. Well, let's talk about MPI. So it turns out, oops, turns out, y'all, there is a ship called the MPI Venture, and it makes windmills, offshore windmills. Who knew? So we're going to talk about MPI and what it is. We're going to talk about you know, remind you of some of our parallel programming concepts. We're going to talk about the six necessary MPI commands that if you know those commands, you can write an MPI program that does anything, maybe not the most efficiently, but they're really the only six commands that you need in order to write a basic MPI program. And we're going to see some examples. Okay, so MPI stands for message passing interface. And what it is, is it's the industry standard for parallel programming, and it's a 200 page document. So if you need a little light reading, if you're an insomniac, you know, just download that bad boy off of the internet and you will fall right to sleep. I'm just kidding. It's very fascinating, I'm sure. Um, anyway, so if somebody asks you, what is MPI? You say, it's an industry standard. Yes, it is. It's an industry standard for parallel programming. Now, there are MPI implementations, and that's that's what I mean to talk about right now, and it is time for my allergy medicine. Um, anyway, it is implemented by many vendors. There's also open source implementations. So Cray, well, Cray is now HPE, but Cray has an implementation, and it so that's what's on our machine Perlmutter downstairs, um, and it is optimized for that particular platform. At IBM, I worked on. Uh their version for their chips as when they were bigger in supercomputing and it was very specialized as well. But 
still the same framework, but a lot of times it's optimized for the configuration for IBM um, systems. Questions? So your MPI implementation mainly deal with PowerPC, or do you also write implementations? For it was with PowerPC. You're trying to date me again <laughs> with the power chips. Um, seven, six, and seven, and a little bit of eight. So is that the implementation that runs at Ornal uh, for Summit? I don't know what they're using now. Some of these parties. Okay, yeah. So maybe maybe a descendant of it or something. Yeah, or it might, you know, it depends. Sometimes the vendors decide to scratch their implementations if something else is more efficient. Yeah. So they often actually build their implementations on an open source implementation. Um, and so MPitch, that stands for MPI Chameleon or something like that. Very strange, I don't know why. Uh, anyway, MPitch is a big one. And that comes out of Argonne, Argonne uh, National Lab and Mississippi State University. They worked on that together. Uh, it's still very active, and that is what the Cray MPI implementation is based on. It's based on MPitch. LAM MPI, eh, I think they're kind of dying or maybe already dead. I don't know. But Open MPI, that's really another big one. Um, and that is actively being developed today. And I know a few Open MPI developers. Um, anyway, so the MPI function library, which is derived from this standard, is what we use when we write C, C++, or Fortran programs in high-performance computing. So there are different MPI standards. So there was MPI 1 and MPI 2. Uh, and the difference between them was that MPI 2 had additional advanced functionality and had C++ bindings. But everything we're going to learn applies to both of these standards. Uh, MPI 3 was major revisions. Uh, it was released in November, uh, September 2012, and it's 800 pages. OK, so I, I lied when I said it was 200 pages before. It's more like 800. Uh, and so there are other additions from MPI 3 that we're not going to cover today. Similarly, with MPI 4 that was released two years ago, we're not going to cover any of those additions, but everything that we learn is going to apply to all of these. It's just we're not going to really talk about it. Yeah. That's a great question. So the MPI standard, there's a committee. There's a standards committee. Um, actually, at NERSC, we have some people who are our representatives on the committee. And then, yeah, and then people get together and they meet, I don't know, once a month at least, um, and then they have periodic in-person or large meetings, um, and and they they vote on the standard and, and what they're going to add to it and stuff like that. So if you go to the, MP, you can just look up MPI Forum, I think it's mpiforum.org or something like that, but anyway, if you go to that, you can learn a lot about what they're doing and how they do it, and maybe someday you can join too. Okay. So even though we won't necessarily cover, like I know with MPI 4, one addition they made was um, functions and protocols for more efficient GPU com computation, communication as well. So right. the working groups, they try to determine what would be the most efficient ways to advance the standard. Right. So let's talk about programming paradigms. So there's there's two primary programming paradigms that, that we can think of when we're talking about parallel programming. So the first one is called SPMD, and that stands for single program multiple data. Uh, and, and so you can, um, if you think about that, you have a single program that you're running and you're operating it on different data sets. Okay. Uh, and then there's MPMD, and that's multiple programs, multiple data. So that's where you're doing different things. You're, you might be doing um, one thing with one type of data, another thing with another type of data. And you can use MPI for either paradigm. So here's, I'm just going to give you some more examples of this. So SPMD, we're going to write a single program that can perform the same operation on multiple sets of data. So this would be equivalent to if we had multiple chefs and they're all making lasagnas. Okay. They're all doing the same thing. Or um, in a real life example, it would be like rendering different frames of a movie. So like, let's say you were rendering um, Shrek. I don't know. Um, you know, if you're rendering this frame and, and that frame, right? Like you're doing the same sort of operations, but 
it's different data that is getting inputted in order to get the output. Yeah. Where does pipelining fit into this? I've never understood where that fits into the paradigm because it's one data, but each operation fundamentally alters its like nature. Right. So pipelining is a form of parallel processing that is a little bit different than what we're talking about. Um, so the, the best real life example of pipelining uh, versus parallelism is if you think about doing laundry. OK, so if you do laundry at home, right, first you put your laundry in the washer, then you put it in the dryer and then you fold it. Right. So that's one. You know, that's you're doing one load at a time in that sense. However, after you take the laundry out of the washer and put it in the dryer, you can put it in another load in the washer. Right. And so now you are doing two loads of laundry in parallel. Right. But what we're really talking about here is going to the laundromat, right? And so you put five loads of laundry all in the washers first, right? And then you take them out and you put those five loads into the dryer. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, so MPMD, like I said, is you write different programs to perform different operations on multiple sets of data. So if you could think about, you had uh, multiple chefs and they're preparing a four course dinner so they're each making their own part of the four course dinner or uh, rendering different parts of the movie frame so if you have shrek and you have fiona and you have whoever else is in shrek i don't even remember um but you know if you had different process different programs to generate each of those things that would be an example um you can also write a hybrid program where you have some processes performing the same task and other processes performing a different task all at the same time you can kind of do whatever you want it's pretty cool Okay, so here are the six necessary MPI commands. So if you know these commands, oh, okay, we've got some great questions here that I'll get to in just a second. If you know these commands, uh, then you can write any, you can write any program, possibly badly. It may not be perfectly efficient, but you can basically write any program. Um, and so we'll go over each of these, but first I'm gonna look at these questions, okay. How do you typically structure MPI programs for MPMV, MD, given that collective communications imply a barrier? The MPI launch command commands also to take just a single file, right? Strictly RMA and requests. Oh, wow, Ray, okay. Um, so um, before there were ever RMA, which is remote memory access for those of you who might not know what that means. Um, you know, people have been writing MPMD for years. Um, a, a big example of this is climate codes. So a lot of times you have one person who writes the atmosphere code. You have another person, well, I shouldn't say person, you know, team that writes the, the ocean model, another one that write, that does the land model. And somehow you kind of need to, um, you know, put all of that together to get a holistic picture of of the earth. So what these people will typically do is they have some kind of coupling code. And in fact, I shouldn't be talking about this. Helen should be talking about this because Helen used to work on this. Um, but but the idea is that you know you might have let's say you have a hundred processes. So you so uh, say the ocean is the most expensive part of of the computation. So maybe you're going to put fifty of your 100 nodes onto, uh, onto the ocean and you know 20 onto the atmosphere and 30 onto the land or something. And so they do some computations and then that every so often they kind of need to sync up, right? Because you know, the ocean does touch the, the atmosphere, right? You know, there's a surface layer there. The ocean also touches the land and the atmosphere of course also touches the land. So every so often you're gonna have some kind of a sync and you're gonna have some kind of a data exchange um, and so, yeah, you're going to probably have some kind of a like a uh, like a communication that is going to effectively be a barrier. So what you want to do is, um, you know, make sure that your your load is very well balanced um, to ensure that that you, uh, you know, that you're not having any processes be idle. That's a great question. Okay, for SPMD. 
Are there multiple instances of the same program running simultaneously? Yes, Usman, effectively that is what happens. Um, so there are multiple instances of the same program running simultaneously. Um, so effectively what MPI does, we'll, we'll talk about this with MPI init, is it, it effectively, it starts, it, it, it just like invokes the, the, the program on multiple processes. Um, and and it, so it starts up and, and the way that they're connected is through a communicator. And so we're gonna talk about that in a sec, but I'll, I'll explain more. Okay, so let's start with the first two. So the first one is MPI init and MPI finalize. These are for initiation and termination. So what you do with this is you is it initiates MPI, MPI init. Uh, you place this in the body of your code after your variable declarations and before any MPI commands. So if you're writing in like C, you know, you do like int main and you do like, um, you know, double X, whatever, and then you would go MPI init. And then you would write the rest of your code. And then at the end, you would write MPI finalize because that shuts down MPI. So you write MPI finalize and then return zero if you're, you know, if you're familiar with what I'm talking about with C. And that shuts down MPI. So you want to place it right at the end of the code after your final MPI command. Okay, so now another thing you might want to know is how many processes that there are and which process rank are you? So that's where we get uh, MPI com size and MPI com rank. Um, so MPI com size is going to find out the number of processes that are all working together in this. So like I was saying before, um, when your job starts, MPI creates multiple copies of the executable running, okay? I don't literally mean it copies anything. I just mean it invokes several copies of the code that are all, they're all essentially the same, except for the rank. So each of them is assigned a rank number. And when you invoke your code to run it, so in our case, we use um, S run, but you might use something like MPI run if you've ever heard of that. Um, so what MPI run or S run does is it sets everything up with the MPI in it. And it, you have told it ahead of time how many processes that you want to run on. Okay, now you might want to know that when you're running your code so that you know what you have to work with so that you can make your code flexible and be able to accommodate for any number of different number of, of uh, processes. So you don't you just don't want to like hard code in oh i'm using four processes because maybe you want to use eight or maybe you want to use 17 who knows so. Um, that's why we have these two environmental inquiry variables so that we can know how big is it that you know how many processes do I have to work with and then which rank am I personally as one of the processes. And the rank goes from zero to size minus one so. Um, so yeah I don't know if you all. Um, Maybe some of y'all who are from countries that had a British influence, you'll know what I'm talking about. But when you enter a building, not this building, because this building's weird, what floor are you on generally? In this building, the answer is the third floor. But that's not right. And that's, you know, that's bizarre. So if you entered a regular building that wasn't built on the side of a hill, what floor are you on? You're on one. I heard you say ground floor. Okay. If we go up, what floor are you on? Two. You're on two. What floor are you on? One. One. Right. Right. So that is the difference between C, because C starts counting at zero, and Fortran. Fortran starts counting at one. Yeah. And MPI is like C, so it starts counting at zero. 
Okay. Glad, glad you're here to, to tell us all how that works. Yeah, they do that in Australia too. It really threw me off. Okay, so then the last ones are sending and receiving messages, right? Because it's message passing. You got to have something to send and receive messages. So MPI send, that is our next um, function that if we know, you know, then we can write any, anything. So um, in this, what we're going to do is we're going to send a buffer that contains some data that we want to send, okay? So that's buff. And um, this next variable count here, that is the number of items in it, okay? And then the next thing is the MPI data type. It's so what that means is like, is it an integer? Is it a floating point? Is it a double? Like what kind of data is that? So this count is how many of that item Okay, so you don't have to know like how many bits or whatever each data type is, you just have to know the number of those data that is in this buffer. Um, and then the next thing is the destination, dest in this case. So um, the destination is like which rank are you sending it to? And then there's tag and the tag is just kind of a special unique um, number so that they know that, oh, this is the right message that I'm receiving, because you could be sending multiple messages. And then the last thing is the communicator. Now, the communicator is sort of like the world in which this is happening. It's kind of like, you know, when you, uh, like, when you send a letter, right? If you send a letter um, within the United States, you can just say what city and state you're sending it to and, and the address, you know. Um, and so that would be the United States communicator. Okay. Uh, if you were sending a, a letter globally, then you would have to also put the country, right? And so um, that would be the world communicator. Okay. Within the context of the world, you're sending this letter versus within the context of just the United States. Probably not the best analogy, but uh, there's going to be a picture I saw. There's going to be a picture coming up, and so it'll make more sense then. Okay, so if you send, you must have a receive, right? So this is our sixth. Uh, this is our sixth function, MPI receive, and so it's it's parallel to the send. So when the send, we sent a buffer. In the receive, we have a buffer that's ready for this data to, to be put into. The count is, again, how many items do we expect to receive? And we can receive up to that number of items in there um, of this type data type. So integer, um, you know, double, whatever. Um, the source, so that's who sent it to us, which rank sent it to us. Um, the tag, and again, that's like that unique identifier. And then and the communicator, which we kind of talked about that. And then the stat, and that's a new one. And that's just to make sure that everything worked out. So you can query that data, the status data type, and you can see, oh, did this message successfully get received or not? later on, but people don't really use that, especially very much, especially when it's like just kind of these basic ones. You might use the status in more advanced um, asynchronous communications. Okay, so something to keep in mind that um, is that standard send and receive functions are blocking, okay? Um, especially receive, receive is always blocking. So. If I do an MPI receive, then I'm not going to I'm not going to return from that. I'm going to just going to keep trying to receive until I actually receive the message. Okay. And if I do a send, usually they'll send. They'll wait until it, they know it got sent, but sometimes they don't. It just kind of depends. So you really need to watch out for deadlock. Um. So let's. So this diagram I think is really helpful. Okay. So. This is about the message passing interface and kind of how it works is, so we have MPI com world. And so that's kind of like our universe effectively. And so we have, we have our process ID or rank, 
within that world. Within that world. So we might be zero, one, two, three, four, whatever. Okay. And then on the actual cluster where it gets assigned, um, it could be on any of the nodes of the cluster, but it's kind of like mapped from our world to the nodes, to the CPUs of those nodes. Okay. Does that make sense? So like technically speaking, uh, if I'm trying to send to process zero, it might actually be on you know, node one, it might be on node 28, who knows, but I don't need to know that. I just need to know its identity as node zero. Does that make sense? Okay, good. All right, so here's like a real example. Um, I wrote this example just to deadlock, like that's the entire purpose of this example. Um, so let's look at it together. So um, first of all, we do this pound include mpi.h. That gives us the headers for the MPI library. Okay, and in C, C++, those types of languages, um, you just that's just one of those standard things. Um, another because we've got this include stdio. That's just our standard IO library. Well, headers for that library, I should say. Um, and so then we've got our main. So int main again. This is just a pretty standard C code. For those of you who are not familiar with C, I'm just letting you know. There's nothing really weird about it yet. Um, so here I'm defining all of my uh, variables. You can see I've got uh, I've got a couple of integers. I've got this status. Okay. Um, and then I'm going to initiate, initiate, initialize, sorry, MPI. And this is just the standard arguments to it is ampersand arg c ampersand arg b. Who knows exactly why? Well, I kind of know why, but I'm not going to bother you with the answers to why that is. Uh, but anyway, so it initializes it. And then, uh, so then we're all set. We're ready for, ready to do our MPI things. Now, the whole purpose of this code other than showing you about deadlocking, is to exchange uh, ranks. So I'm rank zero, I'm going to exchange, you're my partner, you're rank one, congratulations, because you're sitting right there. Um, so I'm going to say, I'm going to send you a message that says zero, and you're going to send me a message that says one. And that's it, okay? Because this is a dumb code that's just here for these purposes. Okay, but so like, that's my goal. So I'm going to get... MPI com size, I'm going to get the number of total processes that are in this, and then I'm going to get my rank. Okay, now the next line here, if NP percent two, that's modulo, uh, if it's equal to one, that means we have an odd number. No, this needs to have an even number of processes, so we're out of there, we're done. Um, if I am an odd number, then I'm going to send to the person who is my rank minus one. Okay, so like she's one, she's sending to one minus one, she's sending to zero. If uh, otherwise, if you're an even number, then you're going to send to your number plus one. So I'm zero, I'm going to send to zero plus one, I'm sending to one. Okay, does that make sense? Like th this is what I'm setting up is we now have partners, we have dance partners here, zero one are going to dance together, two and three, four and five, etc. They're all going to be dance partners. Okay, so then we're going to actually start doing our doing our dance here. So first, I'm going to receive from my partner. I'm going to receive her number, and then after I receive it, then I'm going to send her mine. Right? Okay. So what do y'all think? How's that going to work out for me? Not so good, probably you saw the title too, right? Yeah. You kind of knew where, you know, you knew the direction this was going. Right, because we talked about how receive is blocking, right? So I'm just gonna be like standing out here with my arms out here forever, either until, um, you know, the machine quits, um, you know, it, like it shuts down my job, or the machine turns off or it gets decommissioned, right? Like those are the three choices. 
So, because I don't know any better, I'm just a computer program. I don't know any better. So I'm just gonna sit here with my hands out, waiting for her to send me. Now, meanwhile, she's there, she's going, you know, the same motion, right? She's wanting to get the message from me and she's not getting it. Because again, we have this receive first and then the send. Okay, so if we just, if we have this same code and we just switch those two lines, then we've got a send first and then a receive, okay? So probably in this sort of trivial example, it would be fine. Probably, I probably I can send and, and then put my hands out to receive and I still, I get the, I get what I get, you know, but it may or may not work. And sometimes send is also blocking, especially if it's sending a large amount of data. So with a small amount of data, it's like, eh, hey, you know, I sent that, it didn't really work out, I'll send it again, no big deal. If I'm sending, you know, like a gig of data, right, across a network or something, then it's gonna take a long time to get it sent. I wanna make sure. So a lot of times they'll have different protocols for small amounts of data versus big amounts of data. So for a big amount of data, there might be a protocol that's like, hey, are you ready? Are you ready to get the data? And then they say yes, and then I send my data. So in that case, that is blocking, right? Because if she's not at the send right now, she can't tell me, yes, I'm ready for your data. So um, I'm sorry, if she's not at the receive, I think I said send. If she's not at the ready for the receive, she can't tell me, oh yeah, I'm ready. Because she's not ready. Because she's also trying to send. So that's why this may or may not work. All right, so then there's the safe example. And so it's basically the same, except for what we do is we just reorder it. So I am an, uh, I am an even number, uh, this line right here. If me mod two equals zero, that means I'm an even number. So then I'm gonna send first and then I'm gonna receive. And an odd number is gonna receive first and then send, okay? So that way, if, if it is that protocol, so if, if I'm sending her a big amount of data and I say, are you ready, are you ready? She says, yes, I'm received, look, my hands are out, I'm ready, right? And then, um, and so then I'll be able to send it and then I'll be able to go into my receive and once she receives, she'll be able to go on to send me data and she'll say, are you ready? And I'll say, yes, I'm ready, look, my hands are out. And then everybody's happy. Okay, does that make sense to people? Sort of? Yeah. That is an excellent question. Are they always in a pair? And yes, they are always in a pair. You have to have a send and a corresponding receive. And one to one, that's right. So you have to send to a particular uh, destination and you have to receive from, yep, that's right, yes. Yes, there is. There are non-blocking sends and receives. However, those are not basic, so that's why we're not learning them. But yes, there's like, I don't know, 200 something different MPI functions. Yeah. And yeah, and so there is there is a non-blocking send and a non-blocking receive. Yeah. Okay. The send is not always blocking. Yes, I did say that. So that is implementation specific. Um, and what you will often find is that if there's a low risk send, such as a sending of a very small message, um, and there may be some threshold over which they decide it's a big message versus a small message. Um, so there's different ways of sending. So there's one called rendezvous. Right, and that is when you're sending a big message and you don't want to take any chances. I mean, it's kind of like, could you send 20 bucks through the mail and if it got lost, eh, you know, you just send another 20 bucks, right? But if you send 20 million bucks, you're not sending it through the mail, right? You're gonna meet up with the other person and make sure that they get their 20 million bucks instead of the 20 bucks. So that's what you're doing with these bigger payloads. Um, and so it's called a rendezvous. And so typically the way it works is you send first, first you send a message and this is in within the MPI implementation, right? So you don't ever see this happening, but 
the MPI implementation sends, so I send a message to you that says, hey, I've got 20 million bucks, are you ready? And you say, you send a message back that says, yes, I have the memory ready for your 20 million bucks. And so then I say, okay, here it comes. And I send you the 20 million bucks and then you receive it, okay? Versus if you weren't ready, you know, it just would all disappear in the network or something, it'd be a disaster. Oh, okay. So there's um, right. So there's MPI send, and then there's one called MPI I send. I think you just said that. And so then, yeah, that that is non-blocking just by nature. So even if I'm sending twenty million bucks, you know, it just gets sent, and that's the end. Yeah. Okay, um, because there is another function for that. That's why you can't send to multiple nodes. There's another function for sending to multiple nodes. Yeah, it's called broadcast. Yeah. How do you mark the end of a message? Um, so, um, if you're, if you're talking about like from the MPI perspective, how does MPI, um, note that the message is over? I, I don't really know. I, I'm sure that's, that's based on the implementation. Um, but, but there are, there are ways that you can implicitly tell, I guess, that it's over from the from the non MPI implementation perspective. So with our send, we have this size variable. This is the second one. In this case, it was just one because we're just sending a single number. Um, but so that would be the upper bound of what you would receive from the other um, from the other process. So it, you, you would know like if Let's say it was a hundred. Then, if you if you've received a hundred ints, then you know that's the end. All right, these are all really good questions. Let's see if there's any here that I can answer quickly. Oh, with rendezvous. Uh, okay, so with rendezvous, how do you deal with something like the two generals problem? Oh, I don't remember that problem exactly. When A says, "Are you ready for the twenty million?" and B says, "Yes." Does B wait for a message that A got its confirmation, or does it only do one level of confirmation? Uh, yeah, I think there's another confirmation that goes through at the end. But again, this would be um, this would be implementation specific, I would say. But but yes, I believe they do after after they receive the twenty million, they confirm. Yes, I received my twenty million. Thank you very much. So sometimes they'll include like a confirmation tag to so like in some of the calls you might see a tag. Um, attribute and that can be used to categorize if it's been transmitted properly with the message size. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, the way this is set up seems very similar to the way child processes are created and started, how data is passed between child, parent, and C++. Does MPI take a task and create child processes to then parallelize the main task or does it do something different? I think it's slightly different, Seth. Um, I think that, uh, you know, I'm not an expert on C++, um, but also I think that the MPI way was created longer before the C++ way was, and um, I, I don't exactly know how it, how it, it, it initializes these things, but they could be similar in a lot of ways. So does he mean like... Does so that mean like using, you know, child or fourth processes or? Um, yeah, child processes. In C++. And so that means like the, the fork acts like the parent to create the child processes and then there'll be a join that comes back for it. And so, I mean, it's, it's message passing basically. I mean, mm -hmm. that's a programming paradigm. And MPI is an implementation of message passing. Right. Yeah, that's good. 
Thank you. Okay. Um, Alrighty, so let's go on. Okay, so I think I already kind of explained why these things wouldn't work or would work. Um, okay, so then we have a fun task for you all, which is to compute pi in parallel. Okay, we already talked about does people like pi, uh, and of course everyone loves pi because it's delicious, but also you like the number pi because it's super cool. Okay, so we're going to talk about how do this. So first we're going to start with a project description. I'm going to provide you with some serial code for it. We're going to talk about parallelizing it and then we'll try to do it. And we can see if y'all want to try it or if we should just go on because we are running a little late. Okay, so we want to compute pi. Um, there's a method called the method of darts that you can use to compute pi. Now it's actually a really terrible method as a numerical Analyst, I have to tell you that you do not want to actually do this in real life, but uh, it's very easy to understand. So that's why we're going to talk about it today. Uh, but basically, the idea is that uh, that pi is equal to the ratio of the area of a square uh, to the area uh, of an inscribed circle within that square. It's proportional to pi. I should say it's not equal. So, like, let's say we have a dartboard. And it has a circle of radius r um, and that's inscribed within the square so the area of the circle is pi r squared the area of the square is 2r quantity squared so 4r squared so the ratio the area of the circle to the area of the square is pi r squared divided by 4r squared the r squared cancel out we get pi over 4. okay that's great so how do we find those areas well suppose that we had that square and we were like randomly throwing darts at it okay like truly randomly not trying to hit the not trying to you know hit this the uh the dart board but uh if we counted the number of darts that landed within the circle and the total number of darts that are within the square the ratio of those numbers would give us an approximation to the ratio of the areas right because if we're throwing randomly we're more likely to hit a bigger place or not right um, and so the quality of our approximation increases with the number of darts thrown um, that being said you have to throw 100 times more darts in order to get another um, decimal point of precision so you probably wouldn't want to do this in real life um, and that's why it's kind of inefficient okay so there we go um, I don't know if you all realized that I'm I'm a nerd <laughs> Um, so I actually made my own uh, method of darts cake for pie day because like why not right because I like pies, but I like cake better and it seemed like the right thing to do at the time, so it was delicious um, I didn't count the number of sprinkles, but that's supposed to represent the, um, the <laughs> number of darts anyway. So that's how we're going to calculate pie. Okay. Okay, so then that's great, but like, how do we simulate this on a computer, right? I mean, we know now we can throw some darts or we can make a cake, uh, but how do we do it? So first we want to decide what length R. I recommend R equals one. Uh, and then we generate random pairs of numbers so, such that they are between negative, like each value is between negative one and one, right? Like X or Y is between negative one and one. And then if xy is within the circle, in other words, if x squared plus y squared is less than r squared, then we just add one to the tally for things that landed inside of the circle, right? And then last, we will find the ratio. Okay, so that seems doable, right? Mostly, mostly. Okay, so here's the code. This is a serial code. So I'm going to do a, a million darts. Oops, sorry. I'm going to do a million darts. Um, and then I'm going to, oh, shoot, I keep doing that to myself. Okay, I am going to calculate pi. The way I'm going to do it is I've got a pseudo random number generator that I call LCG random. And because it's included in this, this, um, LC generator. Um, LC stands for linear congruential, 
and those are actually terrible sort of random number generators, but we'll we'll ignore that for a moment. Um, so anyway, I'm going to calculate x and y, see, by generating these random numbers, and if, you know, if it adds up to less than r or equal to r squared, then it was inside of the circle. I'm going to increment the number of darts that landed inside of the circle. And then when I'm done with this loop of a million, then I'm going to print out what pi is equal to. So pi is four times um, the number inside of the circle divided by the number of trials. And then I'm going to print out, you know, what I got there. Okay, and then my next, this is my LC generator dot H. Um, and so this is just my line, linear congruential generator, which, like I said, isn't really the best, but it does the trick for our purposes. Okay, and if you are a Fortran fan, I've got you a Fortran code too. Um, so we will, I'll show you how to download those after a while, but uh, for now we're really just going to talk about how to parallelize. So let's think about what tasks are independent of each other. Um, what tasks we need to perform sequentially, and then we're going to use PCAM to design our parallel algorithm. So, what tasks are independent of each other? Anybody? What tasks? Hmm? Throw, throw in a dart. Good. Throw in a dart. Good. Somebody says that on there too. Good. Throw in the darts. Those are independent, right? Like if if I'm going to throw a dart and you're going to throw a dart, it doesn't matter if I throw mine first or you throw yours first, right? They're still going to get thrown. Doesn't matter what order they're in, doesn't matter who does them. Okay, what tasks have to be performed sequentially? Yeah. Counting how many darts hit each thing. Counting how many darts hit each thing. Like in total. In total. Okay. Well, it's not, not quite, right? Like, yeah, because like you could tell me about your dart and then she could tell me about her dart. It doesn't matter which order per se. But yes, we do have to complete all of that before we can calculate pi, right? We can't calculate pi first and then throw the darts, right? That wouldn't work. Okay. So yeah, I think we've got that kind of all figured out. So, so P stands for partitioning, right? So we're gonna decompose our problem into fine-grained tasks to maximize the potential for parallelism. Uh, so somebody has mentioned, many people mentioned, the finest grain task is the throw of one dart. Uh, each throw is independent of all of the others. If we have a huge computer with, um, you know, a million processors on it, we could assign each, assign one throw to each processor, right? I mean, again, we're not thinking about whether that would be practical at this point. We're just thinking about the potential for parallelism. And so there's a lot of potential for parallelism there. Does everybody see that? Yeah. All right, so the next one is communication. So we got to determine the communication pattern amongst our tasks. So each processor throws their darts and then they're going to have to send the results back to some kind of a manager process. So this is what we call a manager worker algorithm. And um, they're not always the best algorithm, especially scalability wise. Um, but, you know, for this relatively simple task, this is probably the best type of algorithm that we could come up with. Okay, so then our next step is agglomeration. So we're gonna combine uh, into coarser grain tasks to reduce communication requirements or other costs. So to get a good value of pi, we have to use millions of darts. Uh, we don't actually have millions of processors available. Sorry, y'all, I forgot to, forgot to reserve um, Summit for us today or whatever. Frontier, Frontier, forgot to reserve it for us. My bad. Um, furthermore, you think about this, this is the same as the puzzle, right? Where we had, uh, you know, 5,000 people doing the puzzle. Um, then we have to put all of their work together. It's going to cost more to put all of their work together than it is to just do it ourselves practically. So uh, that what I'm saying is that communication between the manager and millions of worker processes would be really expensive. So instead, we just want to divide up the number of dart throws evenly between all the processors that we do have to, to work on this with us so that each processor does 
a fair share of the work. Okay, so then the last thing is about mapping. So assigning tasks to processors subject to the trade off between communication costs and concurrency. So we want to assign the role of manager to processor zero. Um, the reason we do that is because there's always a processor zero, right? Because that's what we start counting from. There might not always be a processor five, or something like that. So we just assign to zero. Uh, so we're going to have zero receive the tallies from all of the other processors and compute the final value of pi. And we're going to have every processor, including the manager, perform equal shares of Dart throws. So as a manager, I can tell you, um, you know, in my work life, I do have a lot of extra overhead compared to everyone else in my group, so I don't do as much of the technical work as they do. But in this case, you know, all I all the manager has to do is just receive these tallies and do one floating point operation, right? So that's pretty easy. So it's really not that much overhead, so they can just do everything that everyone else is doing too. Okay, any questions about about um, about that uh, using PCAM? We had a good question um, mm -hmm. from Gavin Price about multiprocessing Python and the multiprocessing library using multiple processes rather than threads. And I was replying to you, Gavin, that well, technically um, Python supports both. But you have um, multiprocessing with um, processes when you are considering communication that might be occurring off of memory that is not shared within a node. So there's communication from different buses. But within the same uh, node or the same shared memory, you will use threads for that communication. Thread, multiple threads can be assigned to the same process in that way. So it's kind of like a hierarchy. All right. And so Seth had a great question here. Would updating the count be a race condition? Um, yes, Seth, it certainly could be. Uh, it would be, it's something that, um, I, I don't know that I would necessarily call it a race condition though um, in uh, in in this case, because um, you know we know we have to do it, so uh, it, it's just going to be some overhead. Uh, this is how I would classify it. It's really more of an overhead that we have to do that we wouldn't have had to do if we were doing it in in serial, right? When you're doing something in parallel, there's always some parallel overhead, and so I would classify updating the count to be parallel overhead. Um, you would want to make sure to avoid a race condition, um, and we're going to have to be really careful of that when we use OpenMP. But um, with MPI, everyone has their own separate memory. So probably what we would want to do is, you know, if I'm, let's say I'm doing 10,000, um, um, you know, dice, uh, dart throws, I almost said dice throws, dart throws. If I'm doing 10,000 dart throws, I'm probably just going to tally my own stuff up. And then at the end of it, I'm going to send that number, whatever figure I get, I'm going to send that to, to the manager rather than updating them every single time that I get a new result. Because, because yeah, that's, that's kind of what we want. We just want to minimize the amount of, of overhead, extra overhead. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. All right, so here's your assignment should you choose to accept it. Uh, so you want to clone the whole assignment to Perlmutter from our from GitHub. And then you want to copy um, darts um, to um, your, you know, your directory that you want to work in. And you want to parallelize the code using the six basic MBI commands and then call your code darts mpi or something like that. Okay, um, so I think we probably need to get a hand count because like, you know, we should be done with the next section as well within 10 minutes and we're obviously not gonna meet that deadline. So who wants to do this? We can do it together um, or we can just 
keep talking and learn more just understanding it but not implementing it what do y'all think what would be the best use of your time i mean we could go ahead just keep talking because we can always provide additional resources or like a little video walk just trying yeah. to get them as much knowledge as they can all right all right so anyway if if you do get clone this thing um I'll, I'll leave you like a minute here so that you can really read that and make sure that you you get it um it, it actually has solutions in it so you can look at the solutions all right yes i'm going to share the slides after the yeah so actually the slide link for view is already in the q a doc oh even better so it's view only, download a copy to your local machine. Even better, then you can grab it from there. Hopefully somebody can put that link in the chat again, to make sure that people have it. I will do that now. Okay, perfect. Okay, so then we'll, we'll move along. Okay, so next we're gonna talk about collectives. So people were asking like, hey, why can't I send to more than one process right uh well you can it's just it's it's not called send it's a collective okay so collective communications involve a group of processes uh and so we're going to talk about some of these we're going to talk about broadcast gather scatter reduce we're going to talk about the all prefixed ones of those and then barrier all right so broadcast maybe you have a message that needs to be sent from the manager to all your processes. You know, that happens sometimes. Uh, a manager could send individual messages, sure, but instead it's more efficient to use broadcast because broadcast is, uh, you know, it's a function that's implemented in MPI and it's optimized for the system. So what the way a broadcast typically happens is it's kind of like a game of telephone. Okay, like y'all are too young probably, but when when I was your age, actually when I was younger than you, when I was more like my son's age, um, if there was like a snow day or something at school, they would call one person and then that person would call two other people and tell them that there was a snow day. And then that person would call two more people and tell them that it was a snow day, okay? Now maybe they don't do that nowadays like they did back when I was getting on people's lawns and now I'm telling you all to stay off of mine. But um, but anyway, that's that's how a broadcast works. Um, so it's it's designed in like this tree algorithm where you know the the root of the broadcast sends, I mean under the under the covers, this is what happens. You're not seeing this yourself when you're writing the code, but so instead of instead of having to send p messages to p processors it's really sending the log of p messages like that and so that's how long it'll take you know it, it's proportional to the log of the number of of uh processors that you're broadcasting to rather than the number of processors that you're broadcasting to so it's going to be much faster okay so when we're using the broadcast we are sending some something in this buffer Okay, um, and if if we're a receiving, okay, let me back up. So there's a root, and that's who's sending it, right? The root is sending the sending the message out to everyone. Um, and so in this buffer thing here, the root has to have something in there that it's going to be sending, and everyone else has to have an empty buffer where it, they can receive that message into. And so this buffer has count number of items in it uh, of data type mpi data type and like i said the root is sending it and it's sending it across the communicator in the world okay so that's one thing we can do we can broadcast we can send out to everyone maybe on the other hand maybe all of the other processes need to send the same message to the manager something similar to the manager so we could implement this by, you know, 
you call MPI send, you call MPI send, you call MPI send, and I call MPI receive, MPI receive, MPI receive. We could do it that way. But instead, we want to use the gather operation. So it, it uses the tree, it's just the, you know, it goes going the other direction. And so again, instead of it taking order of P amount of time, it takes order of log of P amount of time to complete this operation. Um, and so the messages get concatenated in rank order. So the first message is from processor zero, <laughs> the second message is from one, etc. Um, and so the gather function, the way it looks is you have a send buffer, and this needs to be populated by everyone, except for the root, I think. Well, I, actually, maybe the root needs to have it. I take that back. Um, send count is like how many items that you're sending. So you could send multiple items, right, and of, of a particular data type. Then the receive buffer, this needs to, this needs to be a, a non-empty well, it needs to be a non-zero sized buffer, I should say, uh, on the process that is going to receive everything. So that's the root again, the root down here. Um, and then the receive count, again, that's the number of items received from each process, not the total number of items. Um, and then the receive type. Generally, you know, the send type and the receive type are going to be the same, and the send count and the receive count are also going to be the same. But sometimes you might not do it that way. Um, and then, so then it's being received by this root rank. Um, and the context is this communicator here. Okay. Okay. So you remember we've got gather, and you know, you can send the same message. Well, what if you want to send messages that are slightly different? You might want to send messages that are slightly longer or slightly shorter. So, for example, Let's say I'm trying to gather all of the uh, maximum residuals of each um, part of the subdomain of, of my thing. And let's say I have, uh, you know, I've load balanced pretty well, but maybe I have four subdomains on one process and three on another, right? So I want to receive the information about those, but they may be varying lengths, right? Because on one of them, I'm receiving information about four subdomains. On the other one, I'm receiving information about three subdomains. So uh, I might need to gather information that has a varying count. And so there's this gather V option, V standing for variable. Um, and, you know, it's a little confusing exactly what all of these items are in here. So I'm not going to like go into it terribly, but Anyway, I just wanted you all to understand that there is that option. So if you ever see an MPI function with a V at the end, it means variable lengths, different lengths. All right, so then there's scatter, okay? Scatter, like maybe you have similar messages, but not the exact same message that you wanna to send to all of the other processes. So you can, really long buffer that has like all of the messages in it you can split it into the number of processors different pieces and send each individual piece to each individual process okay uh and then of course there's scatter v which is if you have variable sized messages that you want to send back okay can be a little confusing um but anyway i just want you wanted you all to understand that like this is the way that it works and so these these are functions that do exist that you could use if you wanted to make a more advanced program okay so the next thing is reduce so maybe we want to do a sum of many sub sums owned by all processors hmm did we hear about that in our previous exercise? Hmm. Maybe we need to find the maximum value of a variable across all processors. These are two different things that you might want to do with reduce. And there are other applications of the reduce function as well. But um, you can use what's called a reduce operation across all of the processes. Um, and so MPI reduce 
is really handy. People use it a lot. And so there's a send buffer, which is the, the, the item or items that you want to send to be reduced. There's a receive buffer, and that needs to be non-zero size only on the root. The root. Um, and then this count is like how many items that are being sent through the reduce. And the data type is whatever type of data it is. And then the operation, the reduce operation. So here I mentioned sum. There's um, also I mentioned maximum. There are different operations, which I'm going to show you what those are that are available. So there's a maximum, minimum, there's a sum, product, logical and, bitwise and, logical or, bitwise or, logical XOR, bitwise XOR, and then maximum value and location and minimum value and location. So those are predefined uh, reduced operations that you can use. Uh, most, most of the time, you know, you're going to use one of these first four. You can also um, make your own operation if you want. Um, you know, there's details in the MPI standard about how you would go about doing that. Um, but so the MPI max lock and min lock, um, those return the maximum or minimum and the rank of the first process that it encounters with that value. Um, and so you, you use special MPI pair data types um, when you're doing that. So anyway, that's, that's something that could be useful uh, sometimes, but I don't know that people use it that often. Okay, so that's the reduce operation. And so we could use reduce, because I'm giving it away since we're not really doing the exercises, we could use reduce with our uh, dart throwing exercise, right? So you throw all your darts, I throw all my darts. We got to add it all up. A reduce, right, is a way that we could do that because we've got the sum, MPI sum, right? So we just, you send, you send your stuff through a reduce to the manager process, and then it, it all gets condensed into, um, you know, the sum of all of the values that everybody has sent out. Okay, all right, so then there are operations that are all operations. So maybe you want to have the result of a gather or a scatter or a reduce on all processes instead of just one root process. So in that case, we have these all process, all um, functions. So we've got MPI all gather, uh, MPI all gather V. Because, you know, we can do a variable kind. Uh, and then we've got all to all scatter gather. <laughs> okay, I should mention, yeah, we've got all gathers. Um, we've got, yeah, that's fine. Um, there's all to all. And all to all is something that's going to make your brain hurt. So I'm going to try to explain this. But it's, so it's an all gather where each process sends distinct data to each receiver. So it's like a, a gather and a scatter at the same time. And the way it works is, is um, I have, you know, I have a message for you and for you and for you and for you and for you. And so I'm going to send it out in this all to all. And likewise, you have a message for me and all of the other processes too. And so I'm going to send out all my messages to you all, and then I'm going to receive all the messages from you all in rank order. And you may be like, why would you ever want to do that? Well, I mean, I know there's a lot of, especially like astrophysics codes that you, they, they use all, all, all the time. And the reason is, if you have like you're trying to simulate the universe okay and you have like all these different galaxies what you do is you subdivide the domain of the universe into pieces okay and within those pieces they have galaxies or whatever you know and the thing about galaxies is that they it, they all impact each other because of gravity gravity it, it just goes on forever right <laughs> so 
the gravity of, of the galaxies in this upper corner here is impacting whatever's happening in this corner way down here. Okay, so if you can imagine, I have my universe and it's divided up into all these pieces. I need to send the effects of gravity from my piece up here to everyone else. And they and, and it's individualized because it's based on how far away they are from where I am and so forth, right? And on the other hand, they also need to send everything to me. So I need to send out to a thousand different pieces of the universe, and I need to receive from a thousand different pieces of the universe. Very similar, but not identical information. So that's one example. And there are plenty of others, but that's just one that I know of. Yeah, and I know one of my first paper was on um, different implementation strategies for all to all for gyrokinetic toroidal code. So, you know, GTC lattice Boltzmann methods, they use a lot of global communication mechanisms. And so one of the strategies we did was determining the effects of message size on the all to all communication. And if larger message sizes needed to use a hybrid or different approach. So, the MPI library provides you with a kind of stock, but people can create or modify and make their own alternative communications. And that was one that I did when I used, I created four different implementations of all to all based off the message size, number of communications, number of communicators and stuff. So I'll post a link to the paper in our QA. Awesome. Right. So yeah, and then if you if you really want your brain to hurt permanently, then you can also try to figure out all to all B because that's variable sized or various different ones. Anyway, I'm not going to go into it because my brain is already hurting way too much from thinking about all to all. So anyway, just know that that's also available. Okay. So then uh, there's also all reduce, which is the same as reduce except for that that the answer appears on all processes not just on the root process and in fact you know you'll see here like the root is eliminated from the arguments in the function compared to reduce okay and then last but not least is barrier so there may be a time when you need to synchronize processes and in that case we have the barrier process so it's, it's MPI barrier, and it blocks until all group members have called it. Barriers are really great, especially if you're trying to track down some kind of race condition or something in your in your MPI code. Like if you have some kind of mismatched communicators or, or if there's some place where things are hanging forever, uh, then you can kind of, you can put barriers and then you can say, okay, well, it, 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 it's got to be after this barrier and before this next barrier or something like that. Um, and so that's a good way to, to debug your code. But if your code needs barriers, if it like requires barriers in order to correctly uh, operate, then that's a sign that you may need to kind of refactor your algorithm or how it's working. There's probably some kind of a mistake in it. All right, so if you like MPI, there's lots of things that you can look at. Um, there's the MPI reference, there's the MPitch documentation, there's, uh, there's a really good MPI tutorial from Lawrence Livermore National Lab, and then you can read the MPI standard, like I said, if you're, you know, if you're having a little insomnia, you know, just download that bad boy, put it on your tablet, and just <laughs> straight away. Okay, so then if we were going to do the exercises, we would co do computing pi with MPI collectives, and it's basically the same thing. Um, the difference here is that instead of using sends and receives in order to send the number of darts or whatever, um, what you're going to do is you're going to use an MPI reduce. Okay. You can see that in the solution. Okay, so we're going to switch gears a little bit here. We're going to talk about OpenMP. OpenMP is different from uh okay okay julian at the beginning we learned about different supercomputer architectures the mpi commands can be used universally right 
Yes, Julian, it can. You're correct. OpenMP, however, is really only for if you have a shared memory situation. Right, because you can always pretend that a shared memory is distributed, but you can't pretend that a distributed memory is shared. Um, well, there are some ways that people try to make that happen. Um, some of those would be um, UPC or UPC++, um, and then also something called global arrays. Um, but again, that is under, under the hood that there is a lot of message passing going on in those paradigms. So anyway, where was it? Okay, so we're gonna talk about OpenMP um, and what it is and OpenMP directives are data scoping, um, runtime library routines and environment variables, how to use OpenMP and then hybrid programming. Okay, so OpenMP. Okay, well, like MPI, OpenMP is an industry standard shared memory programming model. There we go. Uh, it was first developed in 1997. There's the OpenMP Architecture Review Board, um, and that determines the additions and updates to the standard. The current standard is 5.2, and the standard includes GPU offloading, um, but we're not going to really talk about that today. And if you have any questions about how the OpenMP ARB works, our own Helen, who is online here, uh, is on that board, and so she can tell you all the ins and outs of what's going on there. Well, thanks. Okay, so Helen added exercises and sample batch scripts uh, using the node reservations to the Google Doc. Thank you, Helen. Okay. All right, so here's some really cool things about OpenMP that I like. Um, so the first thing is, you can parallelize small parts of your application one at a time, beginning with the most time critical parts. Whereas with MPI, you pretty much have to parallelize everything at once. Uh, you can express simple or complex algorithms with OpenMP. The size of your code doesn't really grow very much, you know, just a little bit. Uh, the expression of the parallelism is pretty easy to read. It flows very clearly. You can kind of tell what's going on. Uh, and you can use a single source code for OpenMP and non-OpenMP. Uh, you, you can just have your compiler simply ignore the OpenMP directives. And I'll show you what I mean by directives very soon here so that you can understand what I'm talking about. But basically, there's some syntax that says this is an OpenMP directive. And your compiler can choose to ignore those things if you don't want to use OpenMP. Okay, so the API is a combination of directives that I was talking about. There's some runtime library routines, and there's some environment variables. And then there are three sort of categories of items that are that are directives, runtime library routines, or environment variables. Um, so flow control, the expression of parallelism, uh, data sharing or communication, and then synchronization. Now, the parallel model for OpenMP, it's, it's shared memory, and it's thread-based parallelism. And there are explicit parallel regions, and it is it uses what we call a fork and join model. So you start a, a OpenMP parallel region and it forks a bunch of threads and they all do whatever the things. And then you can close it back up and go back to just a single thread. And then you can open it back up again um, with another parallel region. Okay, so let's talk about directives. And I wouldn't, wouldn't have my nerd cred if I didn't include something about the prime directive, right? Okay, uh, so we'll talk about um, the syntax overview so you can understand what I was saying about syntax. Um, talk about parallel, loop, sections, synchronization, and reduction. Okay, so the basic 
format, if you're a C or C++ person, is you've got this or hash pragma OMP, then the name of the directive, there might be some kind of clause in addition, and a new line. Okay? Uh, all directives are followed by a new line. A new line just means return, enter, you know, just going to the next line. Um, it is case sensitive. Uh, directives follow the standard rules for C or C compiler directives. So there are other types of directives that you can have, not just these, just so you know. Uh, and then if you have kind of a, a directive that has a scope to it, like that includes a, you know, some kind of part of your code in it, then you would use curly braces to denote the scope of that directive. Um, and you would want to have your curly braces start on the line after the directive. So you don't want to put it on that same line because the problem, if you do that, is your compiler that is ignoring those pragmas is going to ignore that whole line. So it's not going to see the opening brace and it's going to see the closing one and then it's going to say mismatch, you know, and it's going to freak out. So instead, you just want to put that on the next line. Now, if you have a directive line that's just like super long, uh, you can continue it with an escaping new line character. So you just do backslash enter. Okay. Now, if you're a Fortune fan, if you're a member of the fun group, um, the way it works is they have these sentinels and then they have a directive name and then there might be a clause. Uh, and so there are three sentinels. They all have the, the letters OMP, but could be like a exclamation dollar sign OMP, star dollar sign OMP, or C dollar sign OMP. So if you're a real old school Fortran person and you're using fixed form code, that's usually most common if you're using Fortran 77, then you can use any of these three sentinels and it has to begin in the first column. Does anybody know why I'm talking about columns in Fortran? Does anybody know why Fortran cares so much about columns? Well, that's a coincidence, but I'm talking about the columns in the code, like which, like where you start the, yes. Punch cards, Punch cards that's right. <laughs> that's right, that was the origin of this. So that's why like, it has to begin in column one. You know, it can't begin in column two, because it's a punch card, right? That's how it is. I should have brought my punch cards with me. I had some punch cards that, uh, that an old guy gave me, a really old guy gave me. Dr. Taylor used to have some in her office. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, it, it reminds me of your origins, right? Um, okay, so then the initial directive line, you have to have a space or a zero in column six. And if it's a continuation directive, like if it's a directive that takes up two lines, then you have a non-space or a zero in column six. <laughs> it seems so silly to talk about this. Uh, then, you know, your other standard rules for fixed form line length and spaces and all that stuff still apply. Now, if you use free form Fortran, which I kind of hope that you're doing if you're doing Fortran, um, then the, the uh, exclamation dollar sign OMP is the only sentinel that you can use. You can't use the others. Um, it can be in any column, but it has to be preceded by only white space and followed by a space. Uh, and if you want to have a long directive over two lines, then you end the first line in an ampersand, and then you put the the uh, sentinel on the second line and then continue with whatever your your um, directive is going to be. And then, of course, you still have to follow the rules for free form Fortran line length and spacing and stuff. OK, so the first directive that we're going to learn about is called parallel. So uh, it's just making a block of code be executed by multiple threads. And so the syntax, if you're a C type of person, is pound pragma OMP parallel. And then there may be some other stuff. And we'll talk about what pragma means in a few minutes. Um, and then we've got the parallel section here where you put your code. And you can see these curly braces. 
that denotes the scope of this pragma. Now, if you are a 4chan person, and really I'm only going to worry about freeform 4chan, I'm not going to do fixed form, sorry, people. Um, but anyway, it's just like this. It's, it's um, exclamation dollar sign OMP parallel. And then, you know, I'm showing you how to do a continuation in case you wanted to do a continuation. Um, and then you have your parallel section. And then it has dollar sign, sorry, exclamation dollar sign OMP and parallel. So that's how it does it. It has parallel and parallel versus using the curly braces like you do in C. Okay, here's an example. This is our first example. This is our hello world of OpenMP. Okay, so hello world from threads. This is basically, I'm just gonna get, okay, we don't know about this, this function yet, but it's basically the same thing as MPI com rank, where you're finding the rank, which numbered thread that, that you're at, right? So it's just gonna be a number. So then I'm gonna print the number where I'm at, okay? So first I'm gonna print hello world from threads. Then I'm gonna have all of the threads print out their numbers, like what number I'm at. And then um, again, I'm gonna print I am sequential now. So oops, you can see like, this is the extent of my parallel directive is just these two lines. Okay, and if you like Fortran, I've got it written in Fortran too. Uh, but it's the same, it's the exact same thing. All right, so I'm gonna run my code. And so, you know, I run it the first time I get hello world from threads, zero, one, two, three, four, I'm sequential now, yay. I run it another time though, I get hello world from threads, one, two, zero, four, three, I'm sequential now. Okay, you all, you all okay with that fact? It's a fact, okay, this is important to understand is that the order of execution is scheduled by the operating system. So you cannot depend on the threads doing anything in a particular order. Okay. And that is that is probably one of the most insidious things in OpenMP, really, is you didn't realize but you actually are depending on it going in a particular order. 99.9% .9 of the time it works out in that particular order. And then there's that 0.01% of the time when it doesn't. And you just can't find that. So that's something to really be aware of. Okay, so the next one is loop. So in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to parallelize a loop. Okay, and like I said before, loops our great thing to parallelize with OpenMP. This is how we do it. So the syntax for C is pound OMP4. And then here are some other optional arguments that we'll talk about later. And then we have our extent, um, you know, again, expressed by, by these curly braces. And then inside of that, we have our for loop. Okay, similarly with Fortran, it's called do because in Fortran, a for loop is a do loop. So, um, so we have our uh, pragma here, um, OMP do schedule, and then, you know, optional additional arguments. Our loop goes here, and then OMP end do. Now, you can see up here, I've got like this type, you can see it on this previous one also. We've got type, um, and then this chunk thing, and, and this no weight thing. Those are all optional arguments. So the type, um, the type, what this has to do with is how you parallelize that loop. So it could be statically parallelized, dynamically guided, or decided at runtime. Um, if the no weight is specified, then the threads, that are doing that loop, when they're finished with that loop, they don't synchronize. They just keep moving on to the next task. So let's talk about the loop scheduling. So the default scheduling is implementation specific. Whatever the implementer decides goes. Um, but the most common ones are static and dynamic, I would say. So with static scheduling, then 
it's a very deterministic thing. If you have the same number of threads on a loop of the same size, then um, the ID number of the thread performing a particular iteration is a function of the iteration number and the number of threads. So you could predict like which thread is going to be doing which iteration. It would be statically assigned at the beginning of the loop. Um, this is good if you have kind of a known predictable amount of work per iteration. So if all iterations have kind of an equal amount of work to them, then static is actually a really good way to go. Uh, there's very low overhead in this type of scheduling because effectively you can schedule based on you know the modulo of the of the um, thread number, right? Like you know, if you have ten threads, then I'm going to take the tenth of each you know iteration. I'm going to take iteration zero, ten, twenty, thirty, forty, whatever. Right, so it's very low overhead because there's no real calculation required to figure out who's going to take what or to figure out what work is still available. It's all just kind of scheduled ahead of time. All right. So then the opposite end of the spectrum here is dynamic. Um, and so in dynamic scheduling, the assignment of the threads is determined at runtime. So it's a round robin thing. So, you know, I take some work, you take some work, you take some work. And then when we're done with our work, we come back and we get more iterations to perform. Um, so this is actually kind of a good way to implicitly load balance if you have a variable amount of work going on per iteration, then this is a kind of a good way to just implicitly load balance without having to calculate anything and figure out how to load balance exactly. Um, but there is additional overhead because you know your threads are having to go back for more work. So someone is saying that the audio is fading in and out for them. Okay, is it because I'm not facing it or something? Is this? I'll try to face this way more. I'll pick on these people over here mm -hmm. because I'm facing that better. Is that better? Hopefully that's better. Uh, let me know if it's not. Yes, question. No, I did not discuss the number of threads that will be assigned. Um, we'll talk about how, how you can set that. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Okay, so this is kind of a table about loop scheduling. And um, you know, it's really here for your information for later. Uh, but you can, the things that you can do is you can, um, you can do static or dynamic, um, you know, those, those, we'll just focus on those uh, scheduling. And you can also do something called chunks. So you can break it up into pieces. So instead of, let's say we're doing static scheduling, instead of, I have, 10 threads and each of them takes, you know, um, iteration 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, and then the next one takes 1, 11, 21, 31, 41. Um, instead, I could say, um, actually, I want you to take, um, you know, a chunk of size, uh, you know, of a particular size. So maybe I take 0 to 4, and then the next one takes uh, 5 to 9, and then the next one takes um, you know, 10 to 14 or whatever. So you can set the number of chunks and you can set the size of the chunks depending on um, what you do in your OpenMP uh, arguments. So anyway, there's different ways to do it. Um, I just tend to like to leave it to the compiler uh, and the runtime. That's usually what I do, but of course, you know, you might want to change it because you might want to do some optimization. Up to you. Okay, so now the next question is about which loops are parallelizable, right? Because not every loop is actually parallelizable. So there are a few requirements for your loop to be parallelizable. So the first one is that you have to know a number of iterations upon entry into the loop. So when you get to that point where you're about to do the loop, you need to know that it's going to run for n iterations and that n is not going to change. 
Okay, the next thing is that each iteration has to be independent of any of the other iterations. So if I'm at step three and I have to have completed the uh, step two uh, in order to execute step three, then that is not a parallelizable loop, right? Because it, there's dependence upon every step. Um, and also there cannot be any data dependence between loops. So the results in one loop cannot be dependent on the results of, of the previous execution of the loop. So uh, not parallelizable loops include conditional loops. So there's a, you'll see a lot of wild loops. A while loop, you tend to see that when, um, for example, you have some kind of a tolerance, right? Like in a numerical method, you'll find often, you know, you're trying to, let's say you're trying to find, um, you know, the, the minimum of a function using the, the nulder mead optimization method. Okay, well, so what you do is you have kind of this like little rope triangle and it kind of goes to, to the right place, but there's a residual, you can calculate like the difference between the, um, the value of the function there and, um, and the, the you know the correct answer or whatever and and there's so there's a residual and so you you keep going until that residual is below a certain tolerance like maybe 10 to the minus 6 something like that um and you can't predict how many iterations it's going to take to reach 10 to the minus 6 right so that is a conditional loop that um is not parallel and I mean, even if it were parallelizable, um, the iterations of that are dependent upon one another because your starting point for your next optimization step is based on the previous minimum that you found kind of thing. So um, it would not be a parallelizable loop. Um, also, if you have an iterator loop, like over a, a list templated list in C++, for example, that is not parallelizable. Um, if your iterations depend upon each other, like I just said, basically uh, an optimization method is a sequential algorithm. So, um, you know, you can't parallelize that really. And then of course, data dependency. Now, one trick that I learned from somebody, I thought it was pretty cool. If you can run a loop backwards and get the same results, then it's almost always parallelizable. So if you think about it, you know, logically speaking, you know, something like you're calculating the minimum of a function or you're finding or you're reducing the residual step by step right like you cannot run that backwards right you know, it doesn't make any sense to to go from a small residual to a large residual right that's that's exactly the opposite of what you're trying to do so that's a kind of loop that you definitely could not parallelize with OpenMP. okay so next we're going to talk about an example here so Gaussian elimination. Has anybody done Gaussian elimination? Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Good, good. Okay, excellent. All right, so for the rest of y'all, you remember like algebra class, in, like advanced algebra class, where you had to compute stuff like, well, you had to calculate stuff like x plus y plus z equals 3, um, 2x minus 5y minus 7z equals 12. Uh, you know, so you'd have like these three equations in X, Y, and Z, and then you'd have to calculate for X, Y, and Z. So do you remember how you did that? Just kind of, you know, in theory, how you, how you would do that? How would you do that? Right, right. So you would take like, let's say the first and second equations, and you would eliminate, eliminate the z variable, right? So then you would have an equation in x and y. And then you would take like the second and third equations, and you would also eliminate the z variable, and you would have another equation in x and y. So now you have two equations in two unknowns. And so then you do the same thing, right? Well, you could do substitution, but we won't talk about that. So instead, we're still talking about elimination. So you would take your X and Y equations and you would eliminate X or Y, right? And then you would get, let's say we're gonna eliminate Y, uh, and then you would get an equation of in X. So you'd get, you know, 12X equals negative 27. And then you would have to figure out what is X, right? Then you have that 
x value, and then you plug it back in to one of those two equations of two nodes of x and y, and you would solve for y, and then you would have x and y, and you would plug it back into like the first original equation, and you would solve that for z, right? So that's, that's Gaussian elimination. It's just it's not called that when you're doing it that way. Gaussian elimination is the equivalent when you're using a matrix instead of, you know, you're actually manipulating algebra in that way. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so effectively, if you take if you take that those three equations with three unknowns, and you just take the coefficients of of the variables. Um, you make a matrix, right? You can see how that would be a matrix of numbers. And then what you're going to do is you're going to eliminate everything below the first number in the first column, uh, everything below the, the first row. You're going to eliminate the second and the third. You're going to make those into zeros by subtracting some multiple of the first row from the second row, right? And then subtracting that some multiple of the first row from the third row okay and then after that then you're going to operate on the two by two matrix that is the last two rows okay and you're going to eliminate the the second number but in, in this case it's now the lower left number you're going to eliminate that um from from the matrix you're going to make it into a zero by subtracting some multiple First, well, the second row from the first from the third row. Sorry. So here's a picture of it, right? So um, in this case, I'm operating on the in the upper left corner here. I'm operating on the yellow row. So what I'm doing is I'm taking the yellow row and I'm subtracting a multiple of it from the second row, such that the yellow uh, the yellow in the first column there of it becomes zero, right? And then I'm also gonna subtract another multiple of that first yellow row from the third row so that the yellow piece in the first column becomes zero, right? I'm gonna do that all the way down, okay? And so then I'm done operating on that one. And um, so now that's blue because I'm done with it. Uh, and then in the second picture there to the right, I'm working on the second row. And so I'm going to subtract a multiple of that second row from the third row, a uh, multiple of it from the fourth row, from the fifth row, from all of those rows. And I'm going to uh, make the yellow, that column be zero, zeroed out. Okay. So, um, in this code that I have here, I've got these three loops. I've got an I loop, a J loop, and a K loop. Okay? Um, and so the I loop represents, you know, which row column am I working on? The, uh, the J loop represents uh, which row am I subtracting the I row from? Yes. And the K loop represents which column am I, am I subtracting the um, i row from? Does that make sense? I think I said that all correctly. Okay, so now we're all linear algebra experts. And so now we can think about how to parallelize this. So the questions for us today are, oh, are, can, can we do the, um, outermost loop can we do the i loop the j loop and the k loop where can we parallelize with open mp so so there's some requirements right so we need to know how many iterations there are and then is there any kind of a data dependence or a ordering that is that is required when we're doing this okay so this outermost loop so remember we're we're picking which row that we're going to subtract from all of the other rows to eliminate the first column. Okay. Yes, everything below that. Yeah, you're right. So that's going to remain non-zero. Yes. 
the, the diagonal is going to remain non-zero. Yeah. But everything else, we're going to zero out everything below the diagonal. Okay, so it does have a constant number of iterations, right? It has n minus one iterations for an n by n matrix. However, our iterations depend upon each other, right? Because the values that we computed at the previous step are going to be used in our current step, right? If we go back one, let's see if I can go back one. Yeah, you can see, right? Like, all, like when I did, when I subtracted this, from all of these rows, then all of these green parts, they all changed. They all got updated to new values. And so if I'm then gonna subtract this from all of these columns, or sorry, from all of these rows, then um, you know these values here are dependent upon the changes that happened in the previous step, right? So that means that one is not parallelizable, that outermost loop, not parallelizable. All right. Um, now let's talk about the inner loop. So that's the J loop. So if you recall, the J loop is like, I'm subtracting this from this, 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 that's J. J goes from, you know, whatever number we're at, I here, I plus one to N or something. Okay. Um, so it has n minus i iterations. Um, now you may think, oh, that's not constant, but it is constant upon entry into that loop, right? Upon entry into this loop here, into this loop, we know that j equals i and j is less than n. Like we know that's that's what we're doing in our in our for loop. So we we can calculate how many iterations we're having there at the right, you know, at the time of entry into the loop. We may not know it right now, but when we when we're, you know, running at that time, we know it at runtime. Um so also the iterations can be performed in any order, right? Like if I'm subtracting the a multiple of this from of this first row from the second row and the third row, right? They're all you know, in order to customize it so that we can get a zero in this first column. Um, does it matter if I, if I subtract it from the first row, for the, sorry, from the second row before I subtract it from the third row? Like, does it matter? No, it does not matter, right? Um, it doesn't matter which order I do it in, and it's not dependent upon, like, if I, I can't, I can do the third row before doing the second row, you know, I can do it in any order. So that means that it is parallelizable. So that inner loop J is parallelizable because we know the number of iterations and we know that those iterations can be performed in any order. The middle one, yeah, yeah, J. Okay, so then K, the K loop is subtracting from these individual entries. So the K is really about this direction, right? So, so let's call this X, Y, Z, okay? Does it matter if I subtract um, the Y's and then the Z's or the Z's and then the Y's? Like, it doesn't matter, right? I can do it in any order, right? Because those are all independent of one another. So like, like, this, uh, like the inner loop, we have N minus I iterations. We, so we know a number of iterations that we're gonna have to do. And, and they can be performed in any order. So this innermost loop is also parallelizable. So that means we could parallelize on either one of these loops. Okay, so now I'm gonna show you how I did it. I add one line to my code. It's in green there. If you look here, here's the original code. I add one line. Fragment ONP parallel four. That's it. That's all I had to add. Uh, that parallelizes the J loop only. Okay. Now, uh, you, may, you may say like, oh, well, why did you parallelize that one and not 
the k loop, right? Because I could do either one. But um, the reason I did that one is because there is some overhead to the forking of the of, of the parallel region. And so if I do this one here, if I do the J one, then I only have to, I only do it. Um, I only do fork and join like n times, right? Whereas if I did it in here, then I'm doing fork and join like I don't know n squared over two times or something like that, right? So it's just going to save me a little bit of overhead. Now um, you could, if you're really adventurous, you could parallelize twice. Like you could parallelize and parallelize again. So I could put two pragmas there. But, um, you know, that's too confusing. That's really not worth doing. So um, instead, it's just, it's just the most straightforward and, and most efficient thing to just parallelize this J loop, the, the outermost loop that you can parallelize. Okay. All right, so now there's some directives about synchronization that we're going to talk about. So sometimes you might need to be sure that your threads execute some regions of, of their code in the correct order. Um, so it could be that there's one part that depends on another part being completed. So that's not parallelizable, right? So you kind of have to unparallelize in order to, uh, to do that. Uh, and then maybe also there's something that you don't need a bunch of threads to execute. So for example, maybe you are printing something out. Um, you just need one thread to print it out. You don't need you know, duplicates of it. So we have some synchronization directives that we can use. So there's one called critical, one called barrier, and one called single. Okay, so critical, it specifies a section of the code that must be executed by only one thread at a time. Okay. And so um, a critical area, you would do pragma OMP critical, and you might name it, might name that region. Um, and you know, so there's a similar format in, in Fortran. Um, and the names are considered to be global identifiers. So if you have critical regions that have the same name, they're considered to be the same region. So that's why you actually do want to name it. If you have no name, you have multiple critical regions, then they're all considered the same. So um, yeah, you, you don't want to accidentally do that. OK, um, single is another one. So with single, you just want only one thread to uh, do the thing that you're putting in the single region. Um, so it's really useful for things that might be thread unsafe, such as IO, like I said, printing out something. You probably only want to print out one instance of it and not all zillion threads printing it out. So you want to use this pragma OMP single. Okay, and then there's a barrier. Um, and a barrier synchronizes all of your threads. So when a thread reaches the barrier, it'll wait until all of the other threads have reached the barrier, and then it'll resume executing. Um, so it's similar to MPI barrier in that sense. Um, and you can have codes doing two different things and reaching different work sharing, different barriers, but they need to have the same sequence of work sharing and barriers in every thread. Now, barrier is, once again, one of those things that it's really useful when you're trying to debug your code, but generally, if you have to use a barrier in order to make your code work, then you may be doing it wrong. So you probably need to uh, figure that out, refactor your algorithm somehow. Okay, now let's talk about reduction. So remember we had NPI reduce. Well, there's, a, there's an open MP reduce too. So reduction, it reduces the list of variables into one using an operator. Um, and you know, so it's very similar to what we learned with MPI. Um, so there's the syntax is pragma OMP reduction, and then there's a list of, so the operation that you wanna do, and then a colon, and then a list of all the variables that you wanna do it on. And so, 
you know, there it's it's different than MPI in that you can actually use a plus and a minus and a times. Um, but that's basically how it, how that works. It's very similar. Okay, we're done with with those most important um, pragmas and directives. So now we're going to talk about variable scope. Um, so we're going to talk about what it means, scoping clauses, and then some common mistakes that people make. Okay, so variables can be shared or private within a parallel region. So what shared means is that, remember, we're using a shared memory machine in, in the case of OpenMP. Um, so we're using a node. And shared means there's one copy of that variable on the node, and all the processes have access to it. Um, and the private means that each thread makes its own copy of that variable. And private variables exist only in the parallel region. They don't exist when there's no parallel region, when you're not in parallel. Okay, so by default, all variables are shared, except for these three exceptions. So index variables of the parallel region loop, that's private. Local variables and value parameters within subroutines that are called inside the parallel region, those are also private. And then variables that are de declared within the lexical extent of the parallel region are also private. So if I declare int j outside of the parallel region, it's shared, but if I, if I declare it j within the parallel region, then j is a private variable. Uh, I would say that variable scope is like the number one source of errors in OpenMP codes, and it can be kind of, you know, insidious, like you, you know, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Um, so correctly determining variable scope is just like a really important thing to do. And you're when you're doing uh, open. Okay, so there are variable scoping clauses, and so the, the clauses are really simple. So one of them is shared, right? Shared variables. You 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 just put shared, and you put you put in parentheses a list of all the variables. So you know it could be shared, it could be A, B, C, D, whatever. So by default, all variables are shared unless they're otherwise specified. Um, all threads. Are going to access your shared variable in the same location in memory and you can experience race conditions if you don't carefully control that access of a shared variable so ideally you would never want to um, change the value of a shared variable except under very careful circumstances okay then private so like you know we had shared we have private and a list in parentheses. These variables exist only within parallel, the parallel region. Um, they're undefined at the start and after the end of a parallel region. So you have to keep that in mind. Um, however, there are, you can do instead of private, you can do first private, and then that will start the private variable with a defined value. Um, and then last private will keep that value after the loop is completed. Okay, so here are some very common mistakes. Uh, a variable that should be private is public. Okay, well, I shouldn't say public. I should say shared. I don't know why I said public. But anyway, uh, that can happen. So then what happens is something unexpectedly gets overwritten and you don't know why and everything gets really confusing and you get the wrong answer sometimes or all the time or whatever. Um, so to solve this problem, explicitly declare all variable scope, okay? Always do that. Um, another common mistake can be non-deterministic execution. You get different results from different executions, okay? I mean, this is probably another sign that you have some some variables that should be proper, that are shared or um, or you're depending on some kind of ordering that you didn't think you were depending on um, ordering of execution so you just have to 
look at your code and try to figure out what's going on. Um, and then a race condition. That is a big one. That and in this case, you'll see that sometimes you'll get the wrong answer. Sometimes you'll get the right answer. Um, and so a solution is, you know, this is usually a sign of a shared variable that that should be private. Um, and you can use a tool like Cray Reveal or Cody to rescope your parallel region or your loop. Um, yeah, so there are tools. Um, actually, I really recommend these tools. Um, Cody is one that we have offered a lot of trainings on recently at NERSC and that we provide for our users. Um, and basically, a machine is a lot smarter than you when it comes to scoping your variables. Um, and so it pretty much always gets it right. Uh, so you can use Cody or you can use Cray Reveal as another tool. Um, and they they will scope your loop correctly for you because, you know, sometimes you just miss it. When you're looking at it, but but the tool will know, um, you know, whether things should be private or whether it should be shared. Okay. So um, I've got my Gaussian elimination because, you know, we're all linear algebra experts as we, as we know. Um, so here's my Gaussian elimination. This is not exactly the same as the one that I had in the previous example because the previous example is correct. So let's look at this and see if we have any mistakes with our, um, with our variable scoping. Okay, so does anybody see any potential issues here? And I'll Perfect in every way. Oh, I see somebody's making some comments here. Let's see what we got. Ah, oh, declaration of ratio. Yep. Okay, so can somebody explain that? Who do you want to you want to actually unmute and explain what you're talking about? Are you too shy? Did I butcher your name? I'm sorry if I did. Um, okay. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Yeah, sorry, I was speaking, but for some reason my microphone was not. Working. Okay, well, we've got you now. Okay, so, uh, uh, I'm new to this, so I'm uh, not entirely sure, but is it uh, like the declaration of the variable ratio? Will yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what's wrong with that? Uh, uh, it cannot access uh, the uh, the parallel the pra parallel part of the code cannot access the variable ratio. Uh, so, yeah. Okay, so you're almost there, but the problem with it is that it's declared outside of the scope of yeah. the of the parallel pragma, right? So yeah. then that makes it into a shared variable, right? Yes. Yeah. So so what's wrong with that? So Exactly. So if uh, let's say I'm a I'm a thread and you're a thread, okay, and I, I calculate ratio for my row that I'm working on, my call yes, row, yes, row, left to right. My row that I'm working on, and so that I store it in uh, in that ratio place. And then I'm gonna use it in my K loop there, right, to uh, subtract those from my from every element in my row. So meanwhile, you come along and you calculate your ratio. And so then you overwrite what I put into the variable ratio. And so uh, you overwrite it with your value. And so I'm subtract, let's say my ratio was five and yours is three. Well, now instead of subtracting five times AIK, I'm subtracting three times AIK, right? Yeah, I got it now. Yeah, so that's that's a problem there that I that I made um, made that mistake. Um, anything else? Anybody see any other problems? Uh, it's 
uh, n minus one uh, j indicating. Yeah. Say it again. Shouldn't it be to n minus one for the j and k iterations? Stop. Um, no, that's, I think that should be N. Um, I could be wrong. Yeah, I think it's N because so, so with the I, the reason that that's N minus one is because we don't have to subtract anything from the very bottom row once we get to the very bottom, right? Because it's completed. So that's why it's N minus one there. The other ones should be N. So that's not, so I didn't put any mistakes in the algorithm per se. I just put mistakes in my parallelization here. So there's another mistake. Yeah. It's so is there like a I did, I've heard about false sharing too, in like cache mm -hmm. issues where you've got the same where it's not an actual data race for that data element, but it's mm -hmm. a data race where you're writing to the same like cache line mm -hmm. for different threads. Would OpenMP know how to handle that for the D um, bottom that assignment? Ah, okay. That is a great question. Uh, I I don't really know. Um, so the question was about false sharing, and so like when you're writing um, to the the cache line, whether it's gonna Charles, do you have any thoughts? Repeat the question one more time. I was handling somebody else's question. Uh, I can ask it in the chat. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah. okay go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't know the answer to that one. Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. Should there be brackets like after Pragma OMP parallel four? Um, if you wanted to be absolutely certain that 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 was the region, then then you could do that. Um, however, because the four is immediately the next line, then it's it's like obvious that that's um, where it that's you know what's going to be parallelized, and then. It itself, that four, that J four loop there, it has curly braces around it. Okay. So, yeah. So you don't really need it, but that's a good question. Yeah. I have a question. I assumed that uh, we would explicitly need to define the variables as either private or shared. Uh huh. We write them, but from the code, they appear as just where we put them in five. Right, so right, we don't need to. Okay, it is a good programming practice to explicitly define what is private and what is shared. But uh, OpenMP won't stop you if you don't do that. It just has its own rules. Yeah, right. So you might, so you can run into trouble like this. Like this is why this is a big deal because you can shoot yourself in your own foot because you didn't put it. Okay, so somebody figured out that ratio was bad. So what about I? Is I okay? No, no, it's an iterator, so it's shared. It's also a shared iterator, but it shouldn't be. Yeah, it, it is shared, but nowhere in the code do we uh, do we alter the value of I inside of the parallel loop, right? So it's probably safe. It's probably okay. All right, what about J? Okay, so if you recall, one of the rules, let me find it. Whoa, I was giving away the answer. One of the rules was, where is it? Um, share private. No, where, where did I put it? Okay, oh, there it is. Everything is shared except the index values of the parallel region loop. Okay, so. That's the, the, the J is the index value of the parallel region loop, right? You can see that. So this, this parallel region here applies to J. So we're probably good with J, like we're okay. Now it would be good practice if we explicitly said that it was private, right? But um, we don't have to, it is private by default. Okay, so now what about K?
It would be private, would it not? Because it is declared within the scope. Oh. Oh, no, it's not declared within the scope. If it were declared within the scope, it would be fine. Right, but it's not. It's declared outside, so it's shared. So we would have a similar problem to what we have with ratio, right? Yeah. All right, so here's the answers. Okay, so um, yeah, ratio and K are our problem children here. Um, so our compiler might actually optimize out K. Um, so we, we could be all right there. Um, but ratio, it's never going to get optimized out. So that's going to always lead to errors. And if we schedule our loop differently, we'll get different answers. And then also, if we just have one thread that's just a little bit slower today than it was yesterday, then we'll get different answers too. So, uh, yeah. That's the problem here. Okay, so this is what we would really want to do if we really declared those variables outside, then we want to put we want to explicitly say what is private and what is shared and you see how I have default none there. That means like if I missed a variable in my listing here of the private and the shared, then the compiler would come back for me and be and say hey what's going on here like. Why did you miss that? And it looks like I actually did miss one. So I missed I. So the compiler would complain at me. Yeah. Why would J? I thought we said J was fine before. We did. We it, and it is fine. It is fine. This is just um just for safety and just for you know good practice. So that so that there's no unexpected things that happen, but yes, it would be fine. Okay, and if you look at my original one that I wrote way back here, oh wait, where was it? There. I didn't define any of the variables outside. I defined them all. So like here, ratio was defined within the lexical scope of the parallel pragma. Um, so then. It's fine, right? It's safe. And also, J and K are also defined within. So, anyways, everything's fine in that. Okay, so good job, everybody, finding the mistakes. Okay, yeah, and like I said, if we set default to none, then our compiler will catch any variables that aren't explicitly scoped. So, yeah, it's going to catch I because I didn't put I in here now that I'm looking at it. Oh, well. All right, let's talk about runtime library routines and environment variables. So um, at the very beginning, we actually saw one of these when I did the hello world, right? Uh, so, but there's OMP get num threads. That's the second one on there. Or no, get thread num is the third one. That's what we saw. Um, and that is the rank of the thread. And so uh, OpenMP also counts, counts like C and, and like um, people from the UK on the building levels. And um, it, so it goes from zero to uh, number of threads minus one. So um, OMP get num threads, that's like M MPI um, size. Uh, and then OMP set num threads, you can do this within your code. I don't recommend it, but you can set the number of threads that you're going to use in the next parallel region. But you have to call it from the serial portion of your code before you get into a parallel region. What happens if you don't set it? The processor just figures out. It's how just to so it'll, um, so that's where I'm going here. Um, so OMP num threads, this is a, an environment variable that you set when you run your code before you run your code, like you put it in your script. Okay. And it sets the number of threads so it'll pick up on that and if that's not defined then it'll just go with one. Okay. And then there's another um, environment variable called OMP schedule and that determines 
how the iterations of your loop is scheduled. So you can just set it to be dynamic or whatever if you don't want to go with whatever the default is. Okay, so using OpenMP, you remember I talked about how you can write a single source code for use with or without OpenMP and your compiler can just kind of ignore the progress. Um, so that works, but like, what about the runtime library routines? Well, you know, there's a macro called underscore OpenMP and it's defined if OpenMP is available. So you can use this to conditionally include the omp.h header file or redefine runtime library routines if you're not including that. Okay, so here's an example. So if, if there's OpenMP available, if we're going to use OpenMP, then we're just going to include omp.h. Otherwise, we're going to define this thing, just set it to be zero. Okay, and then when, it, when I come down here and I want to get my thread number, then it just assigns zero in that case, or it assigns whatever my real thread is based on the OpenMP header files. Okay, uh, and then there are some, um, I, I would say I, I should probably change this from most compilers to like all compilers support OpenMP. Um, and you can enable OpenMP using compiler flags. Um, and I realize actually that the Cray one, um, that's old. I think now they use F OpenMP just like everyone else. So B is uh, up dash F OpenMP, Fortune is dash H O M P. Okay, all right. Well, good. So it is still sort of up to date. Thank you, Helen. Okay, so um, if you're going to run a program with OpenMP directives, oh, I put Corey out here. I didn't update to Perlmutter, but it still applies. Um, you want to set the OpenMP environment variable in your batch script. And so I give an example here. Um, but really what you want to do is we have this job script generator and it and you just put in everything that you want um, and it will it will just set um, set all the variables just as as they need to be so this minus n this minus c it'll put all these things in there correctly um, you should really use the job script generator i can't recommend it enough okay so if we were doing the exercises we would now compute pi with OpenMP. And um, the way we would do that is we would, uh, we would use the reduce operator, right? The reduction. So uh, you can see those answers in the, in the, uh, in the git um, that you cloned. All right, last but not least, we're going to talk about hybrid programming. I think we have just enough time to talk about this. So hybrid programming, we're talking about our motivation, why we want to do it, what we should think about, MPI threading support, um, how to design hybrid algorithms, and, and then some examples. So the fact of the matter is multi-core architectures are here to stay. I probably don't need to tell you all that, because, but you know, when I was, like I said, when I was your age, we didn't have um, multi-core. We just had one core. <laughs> uh, and so if you have this type of architecture, then the best way to exploit the parallelism is to use MPI between nodes and open MP within nodes. And this is a hybrid programming model. It's MPI plus something else, MPI plus open MP. Okay, so you're like, okay, great, but is hybrid programming always better? No, it's not, especially if you did it wrong. It's not good. Um, it, you have to think about the architecture of the machine and how it's going to work. Um, so you think of, think of this like an accelerator. Um, so if in your parallel region, you're, you're using the power of multi-cores, and in the serial region, you're using only one core, right? So if your code can exploit the power of multi-cores a lot, a lot in quotes, 
then try hybrid programming. Now, how much is a lot? I mean, it, it's whatever you think is a lot. So if you think it's good enough, then you should do it. There's never a, a yes or no answer, I'm afraid. Okay. And if you look at the paper I posted, like those were kind of the, um, the experiments we did in changing the sizes of different threads and messages and hybrid and um, either just MPI models so we could see which would be the best performed. And a lot of times it depends on application characteristics. years later still the same problem yeah yeah exactly okay so here are some things to think about and again they're, they're not going to qualify or disqualify you from doing hybrid programming they're just things to think about so are communication and computation discrete phases of your algorithm there's actually quite a few algorithms where that's true you, you do a bunch of computations then you do communications then you do computations then communications um can you or do or is it already true that um, communication and computation can overlap one another you know it's just something to think about um, and then how do you want to communicate between threads so do you want to communicate only outside of parallel regions or do you want to have like a manager thread that's responsible for communicating with threads on other uh, other mpi processes um, or do you want to have some of your threads performing interprocess communications or do you want to just have like a wild west free-for-all and let everybody communicate with everybody so you just kind of think about how you want to do it you know there's no right or wrong there may be some things that are more right or more wrong but there's no truly right or wrong to any of these okay so mpi the mpi2 standard and above um defines four threading support levels. So the zeroth one, because we're thinking in C mode, uh, is MPI thread single, where only one thread is allowed. Okay, the second one, or the, well, the first, number one, <laughs> is MPI thread funneled, where um, the master thread is the only thread permitted to make MPI calls. And then there's serialized, that's, Number two, where all threads can make MPI calls, but only one at a time. And then there's three, which is MPI thread multiple. There's no restrictions. Wild West, you can do whatever you want. And then, um, you know, we say like 0 0.5. This is uh, MPI one, where uh, MPI calls are not permitted inside parallel regions. So that's essentially the same as MPI thread single. Okay, so if you want to know what threading model your machine supports, you run this handy dandy program. And so I, in fact, ran this program today, shortly before this. And um, I was surprised because I'd never run it on Perlmutter. I always run it on Cori, our previous machine that just got decommissioned at the end of May. And um, Cori only supported level two. But Perlmutter supports level three. So if we could recall here, level three, MPI thread multiple, no restriction. I was actually very surprised by that. <laughs> um, I was very surprised by that. So there we go. So if you're going to do threading within your MPI code, then instead of MPI init, you use MPI init thread. Okay, and what you do is you, you say which level that you want, and then it returns to you which level you get. Okay, so um, the level that you get, ideally it should be required, the one that you required, but if, it, if that's not available, it'll return the lowest level greater than what you required. And if that's not available, then it'll return the largest level less than what you required. <laughs> and if you just use plain old MPI init, that's equivalent to just saying that your required is MPI thread single. 
Okay, and then MBI finalize, um, you know, you call that at the end of your code. It needs to be called by the same thread that called MPI init thread. Okay, so then there's some MPI functions that have to do with this. So is, is thread main, that's a good one, that tells you whether this is the main thread. And so you would use that in, in the cases like, uh, like here where only the master thread is allowed to make MPI calls. So you would want to know if it's the main thread. And if it is, then good. Uh, and then MPI query thread, this is like if you, if you can't remember which level that you got, this will tell you which level of thread support that you have, that you're currently operating under. I know that sounds a little crazy, but you, you may actually need to know that, that um, and change your algorithm depending on which level is provided. Okay, so if it's MPI thread single, then this is what you would do. Uh, whenever you, if you were in a parallel region and you want to use uh, an MPI function, then you would do pragma OMP single for that function. Um, if you if you had a funneled threading model, um, then you would do. Uh, OMP master so that only the um, only the main thread would be able to use this and I'm, I see that's an unfortunate name I don't know if they've updated the name from master to something else but they probably should if they haven't okay uh, and then serialized so you would use the single pragma in order to um, use your MPI function. So again, single just means like one at a time, right? Um, and and so that's how you would do it. And you don't need a barrier at the end. Okay, and then multiple. Okay, so I did not update these for this because I didn't remember that this was not updated, but uh, the Cray one supports multiple now. So this is new to me, new news to me, new news to everyone here. Um, and before they could turn it on with an environment variable, but it had pretty lousy performance. So I did not get a chance to look at the uh, man MPI page, um, but it might tell you that same thing, that it's really not very good performance. A lot of times in the multiple threading model, um, you know, like open MPI is, a, is another open source implementation and they're kind of like, um, yeah, we have that, but uh, you can kind of use it at your own risk. Like we don't really recommend that you use it. It may not work. You know, there may be race conditions. We haven't um, quite figured everything out. Okay, so, but when, when you use multiple threading, I mean, the rules are that the ordering of MPI calls is maintained within each thread, but not across the MPI process. So you're responsible for preventing any race conditions. That's kind of a tall order sometimes, so that's why I'm not always excited about people using multiple, especially inexperienced programmers trying to use it. I wouldn't use it myself. I would say I'm, you know, fairly experienced at this. I, I just, it just is um, a little too stressful for me to make sure that I'm preventing all race conditions. Um, and then blocking MPI calls, they block only the calling thread. So like the receive, you know, that we were talking about, it's just gonna be that one thread that's gonna, gonna be waiting forever for a receive. It's not gonna be all the other threads. They're gonna be able to get along in their own business. Um, and really multiple is rarely required. I mean, the vast majority of algorithms can be written without it. So I would like, like I said, really discourage the use of the multiple threading model. Okay. So which threading model should you use? You know, my answer is a resounding, it depends. So the nice thing about the single model is that it's portable because like every imp implementation of MPI is gonna support this. Um, but of course there's not as much flexibility. Um, the funnel, you know, it's, it's a lot simpler to program than some of the other ones, but you could run the risk of the manager thread getting overloaded. Um, serial gives you the freedom to communicate, but you know, 
too much freedom is can kind of be a bad thing. Um, you might have too much cross communication. You have to, you know, like I said before, in, in case of all parallel algorithms, you have to kind of balance the uh, parallelization and being able to, you know, do a lot of things concurrently and the overhead associated with, you know, doing things in parallel that wouldn't be there if you were doing them in serial. Anyway, so you kind of have to balance those. Um, and then multiple, you know, in theory, it's completely fred safe. In practice, I am not so sure. Um, and it, it can have kind of suboptimal performance when you use multiple. Uh, at least that's what the implementations say. I mean, it's not just me ragging on them. It's the truth. They say that they have suboptimal performance when you use multiple a lot of times. Okay, so I just want to keep this in mind. This is kind of like, this is my mom moment for you all. Um, just because you can communicate thread to thread doesn't mean that you should. Kind of like, you know, when your mom's like, if all your friends were jumping off a bridge, would you do it too? You know, it's like, just because you can doesn't mean that it's a good idea. Um, so there's kind of a trade off between loving messages together and sending individual messages. So when you love messages together, yeah, you have a big message that you have to send, and but it has like one overhead. It has the overhead of sending that one message versus if you're sending individual messages, you know, there's overhead to each of them. So there's more latency total that's happening there. Um, but you may have less wait time if you think about it. Like if I'm waiting to send a message and I'm waiting for you to get ready to send your message and I have to wait for you to send your message so that I can send mine, maybe if i just sent mine and gotten a res response back maybe that would have been faster who knows um and then another another challenge with hybrid algorithms is programmability so i you know i've written my share of these algorithms and you know the performance is just going to be great when i get it working right there's just one more bug that i just need to fix that's all and then after that it's going to work great so Anyway, you just got to think about all these things when you're trying to design a, a rather complex algorithm. Okay, so I'll give you some examples. Um, this is a mesh partitioning algorithm. So it's very common. It's a very common type of problem that people are using a supercomputer for. So um, you have a regular mesh of finite elements. And so you partition the mesh into chunks, and each of the processes gets a chunk, right? Um, and but because each of them gets a chunk of the work, there's there's a you know there's a line between each each of them that you have to communicate across, right? So you have to communicate what's happening in your chunk to your neighbor chunk so that they can update their you know their calculations as well. So you have to communicate information about domain adjacent cells to computationally remote neighbors. So if we have a mesh, I mean, I'm just making a simple example here, and we divide it into four parts, right? So we've got, uh, this, is, this is our MPI processes. So our process zero has the red part, process one has the yellow. You, you can see where I'm going there. And then each of them, I'm gonna give them four threads also, just for the sake of simplicity. So, you know, thread zero is really responsible for just this corner. Thread one is responsible for this on processor zero. And then processor one has its own thread zero that's responsible for this yellow. Anyway, I hope that all kind of makes sense how that works out. So then I need to communicate right across these borders, like from processor zero to processor one. So here's kind of the thing, right? Like that if I if I communicate everything in bulk here, like that's this purple that represents the, the bulk communications of what I have to communicate. Um, or I could do kind of these little green communications, right? So you can see this is like one big message that I'm sending across. And then these are like some small messages. If I'm, you know, it, it, it depends on how I decide to do it, right? If I'm, if I'm in this, um, you know, wild west free for all where this thread can send to that thread, then you can see I'm sending all these messages that I, that, um, in the other ways, I'm only sending one message each. So, I mean, it seems to me like this is a little bit easier paradigm, you know, just send these purple messages. 
instead of trying to send these green messages and make sure that they get to the right place. If you want to communicate like pink to orange, like T3P0 to T3P1, uh, like what is that big message really communicating? Is it communicating all of the information in P0 or? Yeah, it, so it would be communicating, yeah, all, like all the information from T0, T1, T2, and T3, and it's just going to all go to P1. Yeah. Whereas if I'm like from from T3 here, I got to communicate with this little piece here and this little piece here. Right. So I'm sending or real T2 is a, a better example because it's not on the edge. T2, I'm sending three distinct messages about what's going on with me. So, I mean, you can do it. You know, I'm not saying you can't do it. It's just different ways to think about it and what would be best for your particular algorithm. And to me, simplicity is best, honestly. Okay, so if we were doing our exercises, then we would put it all together and we would write a code with MPI and OpenMP in it all together. And then we would say, yay, and we would celebrate. Instead, we can just celebrate another way. So let me just tell you about a few resources for OpenMP. So if you are interested in OpenMP, May I recommend this book? I have an autographed copy of this first book because look who wrote it, Helen. Yay, Helen. Yes, so it's a great book. Uh, it's it's um, used in classes. It has actually been translated into Chinese and it's used in, in China as well for OpenMP classes. So amazing, amazing. Um, and then there's some other good books like uh, that are on OpenMP as well. Um, and there's a really good OpenMP tutorial at Lawrence Livermore. Um, and yeah, this one is, I think this is, I don't know if it's still up anymore. I should look to make sure, but this is where I got the tip about doing, a, doing the algorithm backwards. And then that's how you know that it's parallelizable. Okay, and then, um, yep, this is a good course. I remember looking at that. OpenMP.org, that is where they have the OpenMP standard. So no offense to Helen, but this is another one where if you need a little light reading because you're you having insomnia, you know, just lick this one right on up and you can sleep very well. No offense, Helen. <laughs> and yeah, and then hybrid programming, there's a lot of good resources about that. Um, and that's it. So that's really all I have. Oh, it's 4.53 is the official time. So it says 4.56. Um, so if you're interested in about how to compute pi, I can tell you about that. Uh, don't use a method of darts. Um, look it up or use the BBP formula. Uh, and then, of course, your programming language probably has a constant. Um, random numbers. I told you we used a linear congruential generator. That's a terrible way to produce pseudo random numbers. Um, because, okay, so there's these properties of a good pseudo random number generator. So first of all, they have a very long period. They're uniformly distributed, the numbers. Uh, it's reproducible and it's quick and easy to compute. So um, <laughs> our generator has a very short period. It's not uniformly distributed. It's known to have correlations, but it is reproducible and it's quick and easy to compute. So it's like two out of four, it's not bad. Um, there's a related linear congruential generator called Randu. You should look it up on Wikipedia, it's very entertaining. Um, Randu was uh, used for modeling our nuclear stockpile. So I know we're all feeling really safe now after me telling you that, but this is a graph of, um, I guess it was triples of Randu, so triple, you know, like three numbers in the sequence, then the next three numbers in the sequence, and um, you can see it's these planes. Yeah, so that's not very good. That shows a pretty bad correlation. So don't use a uh, linear congruential generator. They're actually pretty lousy. All right, if you really want to use one, Mersenne Twister is kind of the best one out there from what I understand. The GNU Scientific Library has 
Mersenne twister. Um, the Intel MKL has the Mersenne twister. And then Spring is the leading parallel pseudo random number generator that uh, you can also use. So there we have it. Uh, so if you have any questions, I really appreciate everybody sticking around who did stick around. And um, yeah, let me know. Yeah.